Uh, I want to welcome everybody and thank you for being here at the Health is Primary event uh, for Raleigh and for North Carolina. We're excited uh, today to be on our tour of communities around the country uh, where primary care and family medicine are making health primary. Our campaign, Health is Primary, is collecting and sharing stories of the innovation uh, that are driving the future of health in America, and you will hear just a, a sample of that incredible work being done here uh, in North Carolina, and our, our effort is to highlight that and set it up as an example for uh, other areas of the country maybe uh, uh, dealing with similar issues. So I'm Glenn Stream. I practice in La Quinta, California, and I'm the president and board chair for Family Medicine for America's Health, which is a newly established organization representing eight national family medicine organizations that represent practicing physician, our certifying board, folks involved in research, and folks involved in academic medicine and training as well. Family Medicine for America's Health has come together with one mission, and that's to improve health in America. As everyone knows, our nation is in a health crisis. Uh, we have the most expensive health care system in the world, and yet we la rank, rank last or almost last in any metric that you look at of, of population health. Uh, and so we're committed to making a change. It's time to put the health back in health care. We believe that the solution to many of our health care problems can be found in primary care. We're so convinced of it that we built this Health is Primary campaign to make the case to patients, payers, and policymakers that a strong primary care system will allow us to deliver on the promise of the triple aim, better health, better, better health care, and reducing costs. The evidence for primary care is strong and speaks for itself. We know that access to primary care can help us live longer, healthier lives. In areas of the country where there are more primary care providers per population, death rates for cancer, heart disease, and stroke are lower, and people are less likely to be hospitalized. An increase of just one primary care physician per 100,000 population can decrease costly and unnecessary care. Outpatient visits decline by 5% inpatient admissions by 5.5%, ER visits by 10.9%, and even surgeries by 7.2%. Evidence also shows primary care uh, is associated with a more equitable distribution of health in populations. U.S. adults who have a primary care physician have 33% lower health care costs. Medicare spending is lower for states that have more primary care physicians, and those states have more effective, higher quality care health, quality, and cost. That's the triple aim that we must achieve and believe primary care is best suited to deliver on that. I'd like to go ahead and show a brief video. When we were growing up, medicine meant our family doctor. When we were sick, had a broken bone, or got hurt, that's where we went. The technology was simpler then, but our doctors took care of us and helped us stay healthy. Things changed over time. We changed, and healthcare started to change too. Scientific advancements made medicines and treatment better, but the healthcare system got more complicated. We started spending a lot more money, but all that investment didn't make people healthier. Healthcare started to feel a little disjointed and impersonal. Now everybody is talking about reform and the system. It's gotten pretty loud, but nobody's really talking about health. Good health, isn't that really what we all want? Our country has the best doctors, the best hospitals, and the most innovative scientists. Shouldn't we be healthy? Somewhere we lost our way. We forgot what matters. We need to embrace the values that make people healthy, like a long-term relationship with a trusted doctor, someone who knows us, our family, and our risk factors, someone we can connect with when we need them, who uses the latest technology, someone who can help us stay healthy, and when we're sick, help us get the most from the healthcare system, someone who can see the big picture, and the small one, that's what the best healthcare should be, a system based on primary care that can make our advanced medical system work for real people. We know how to get there, and going there now can give us a system that works for everyone and makes us healthy again. Now is the time. Together, let's make America a place where health is primary. So what does healthcare in America look like when health is primary. We believe it looks a lot like family medicine. 
And we want to work that ensure whether your primary care provider is a family physician or other primary care provider, that you can live in a place where health is primary, a place where doctors and patients work together in true partnership, where doctors have long-term relationships with their patients and see and treat the whole person, using technology that supports and fosters the connection between patients and doctors where everyone has access to a medical home where most, if not all, of their health care needs can be met and where their other health care needs can be coordinated in a more expanded medical neighborhood. Where prevention and wellness uh, and uh, health promotion are as important as treating disease. Where doctors uh, work with community leaders to address individual and population health. Where health disparities are reduced by increasing access to good primary care and where financial incentives line up with good care and better health outcomes. Today you will hear from our panelists uh, about their practices and their stories, sharing their work to ensure a primary care workforce in North Carolina and around the region. Their conversation today will focus on different aspects of their work and the innovations that are helping them drive results for the communities and practices across the state. While these stories may seem different, there's a common theme. They all focus on delivering continuous, comprehensive, coordinated, and compassionate care, the model of primary care that we believe and know can transform the healthcare system in America. Ensuring a strong foundation of primary care is what's going to help make us healthy again. In addition to our work to spread the word about how primary care is delivering better care, uh, and better health at lower cost. We want to do the work necessary to take it to scale and accelerate the pace of reform. That's why in lockstep with our work on Health is Primary, we're working with other primary care groups, uh, payers, policy makers, employers, to enhance and modernize the primary care health care delivery system in this country. We'll be forming multidisciplinary teams to expand access to the patient-centered medical home, to improve the use of technology and practice efficiency and patient care, to recruit the best and brightest to primary care workforce, and to shift to a comprehensive payment system that rewards value over volume. This won't happen overnight, and we can't do it alone. We're inviting our colleagues in healthcare, employers, payers, patients, and the broader medical community to join us in this cause. And uh, we're collecting and sharing models of innovation that are going to help uh, make America a place where health is primary. And that's what today's se session is about, to really highlight the good work happening in North Carolina and show it as an example to other parts of the country. So I'd like to uh, introduce our moderator, T.R. Reed, and I'm going to turn the uh, conversation over to him, who knows and has seen firsthand the ironclad rule that primary care is the foundation in healthcare systems that deliver for patients and communities around the world. T.R. Reed has become one of the nation's most known reporters through his books and articles, documentary, uh, documentary films, his reporting for the Washington Post, and commentary on NPR's Morning Edition. He's written nine books in English. I've had to read this several times, and it always amazes me. Written nine books, three in Japanese, and, and translated one from Japanese, and I confirmed this the last time, from Japanese to English. So uh, his 2009 book, The Healing of America, which is a survey of healthcare systems and innovation around the world, became a national bestseller. And his film, U.S. Healthcare, The Good News, highlighted stories about parts of our healthcare system in the United States that are working, similar to the stories we're going to highlight today. And since that's what we're trying to do with Health is Primary, he's here to uh, tell us the, uh, these stories and help moderate our discussion uh, and to interact with you as well. So now I'd like to turn it over to Tom so we can lead our discussion with our panelists uh, and uh, talk about the experiences here in North Carolina. Tom? Please help me in welcoming Tom. Thank you, Doctor. Hi, everybody. Uh, look, I am delighted to be back in North Carolina. I know I'm in North Carolina because I had grits and country ham for breakfast. <laughs> it was fabulous. It was great. And I think if you're going to come to Raleigh, mid-April may be the peak time. The dogwoods, the azaleas out there, just glorious. Just a wonderful time to be here. And also for me, uh, coming back to North Carolina is kind of coming home. As I'm sure you know, there are a lot of reeds in North Carolina. Uh, my grandfather, also Thomas Reed, used to say to me, man, you know, uh, a state with a town called Reedsville, what's not to like, you know, kind of thing. 
uh, and, and my ancestral reeds, I, most of the reeds I think came here from Scotland and Northern Ireland. My ancestral reeds came from Northern Scotland, from the Highlands. Uh, they came here in the 1850s. They settled somewhat south of Raleigh in a county that you now call Scotland County because of all these immigrants. And my ancestors, they were from the Highlands. That was a little too flat for them, so they eventually moved west to the uh, eastern slope of the Blue Ridge and settled in Tryon, North Carolina. And we used to have reed reunions in Tryon State Park every other year. My, this is a long time ago, but my great uncle Fred Reed was the mayor of Tryon, North Carolina for decades. Nobody would dare run against him. So um, uh, it, it is like coming home for me. And I think that urge to live in the mountains must run in the blood because I settled in Colorado. And uh, as I'm sure you know, we're the highest state in the country in more ways than one. And, uh, uh, but it's good to come back. And another reason is, as Glenn said, I'm just a reporter who got interested in health policy. And for anybody in health policy, I wonder if you know this as well as those of us who don't live in North Carolina, your state is really considered a major innovator in improving delivery of health care to Americans all over the country. People look to North Carolina for ideas. We know that you lead the country in college basketball, that's clear. Uh, but also in health policy innovation, and as we're going to hear today, uh, the innovative ideas to improve uh, health care delivery, improve population health in North Carolina, they, they come from everywhere. They come from industry, they come from the great universities, uh, some ideas come from a one-woman health care practice in Rayford, North Carolina, which I think is going to blow you away. It's fabulous. Uh, there's just a lot going on here. One thing that I had heard of many years ago was this organization called uh, Community Care of North Carolina, which has basically taken over the uh, Medicare, Medicaid, I'm sorry, practice. And... Um, as a result, North Carolina in the whole country has some of the finest outcomes for Medicaid patients at the lowest cost. You really have become leaders in the country. We're going to hear about that today, too. Uh, and the striking thing is m almost all these innovations come from family docs, primary care doctors. And that's not too surprising because, as Glenn said, you know, when I, when I run around the world, I found this ironclad rule. Places that emphasize primary care have better population health at lower cost. It always happens because this is the key. And when I was traveling the world looking at health care in other countries, health ministers and health care economists always said to me they, they think the proper ratio of uh, specialists to primary care doctors is about, the, the primary care ought to be about two to one, or 60% primary care and 40% specialists. And of course, the US is upside down on this. We need to get more of our medical students into primary care because that is the route to population health at lower cost, uh, which we're going to hear about today. We really have a stellar group of people to talk about this today, I'm going to ask our doctors and healthcare leaders to introduce themselves now, and then we're going to just talk to you about some of the some of the really leading edge things that are happening in North Carolina today. And at the end, after we talk, we're going to have a question and answer session, which t these tend to be pretty lively. But if you don't want to wait, or if somebody says something that you don't understand, we we have some cards at the table. Write them down. Write down your question, pass them up, and I'll see that they're asked and you won't have to wait. Um, so I think you're really going to enjoy um, hearing, I hope, I don't know that North Carol Carolinians know how innovative, what a leader your state has been in this field, but we're going to tell you today. Um, and we're going to do it with these uh, six presenters. And would you introduce yourselves? I'll start with Ed. My name is Ed Bougeau. I'm a private solo practitioner in Granite Falls, North Carolina, which is a small town in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. Um, over the course of the years we've been there, we were fortunate to certify as a level three patient-centered medical home. We also certified with NCQA as a diabetic and stroke coronary artery uh, center of excellence. 
and uh, tested for meaningful use too this year. We haven't been audited yet and we haven't gotten money, so I'm not sure if we made the pass through or not, but I think we did. Um, also, the practice is a member of the Triad ACO in Greensboro. Uh, we practice a full range of family medicine, excluding obstetrics. I still do a lot of inpatient work in the hospital in, in addition to the outpatient stuff that we do. Um, for 25 years, I've also been involved in a practice-based practice -based research network <laughs> Uh, that the American Academy of Family Practice runs called the National Research Network. And I've also, um, in addition, gotten pulled into the North American Primary Care Research Group and do some work with them too. Uh, partly because of that work, I was asked uh, a few years ago to become a chief medical officer of KPN Health Analytics, which is a company based in Dallas. and. They specialize in the extraction of data from multiple disparate electronic sources, um, which uh, they help people in research, um, people in ACOs, hospitals, and physicians in practice to do population disease management. Thanks. So, thank you. Mary. Good afternoon. Good morning. I'm Mary Hall, and I have, I'm from Charlotte. I've been in Charlotte for 28 years, my whole career since my fellowship. I've always been in academics. I had planned to do academics for a few year, years and then go into a small town, but um, academics grabbed me. I've been a program director, residency director for 10 years, a chair for eight or nine years. And about three and a half years ago, I was asked to move up to the, to the Office of Medical Education. So in Carolina's healthcare system, we, have, we are one of the fifth, the fifth academic medical center in the state. We have 30 residency programs and fellowships and a branch campus of the UNC School of Medicine. And that's what I'm in charge of now. So when I um, moved over to that role, I actually increased my, my role with family medicine nationally and, and in the state just to make sure my heart stayed whole and my stole, soul stayed fed. And so in, a week, I'll, in two weeks, I'll take over as the president of the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine and continue to work to bring family medicine values and principles throughout my large health care system. Thanks. Kathy? Thank you. I'm Kathy Pettit, the executive director with DirectNet, which is a PPO in Hickory, North Carolina, that is owned and operated by local self-insured manufacturers in that community. Um, we spend about 10% of our organization's resources on the PPO, and the other seven or 800% on um, uh, patient-centered medical home activities that we administer for those self-insured plans. Um, we implemented our first medical home in 2010, followed by two um, other large medical homes in 2012. We will roll out our fourth medical home in Cleveland, Ohio, for one of our um, companies that has a large operation there in June of this year, and we're doing that in partnership with the Cleveland Clinic. So we're really excited about that um, new model that will be in a different region and area for comparative purposes. Um, in our local area in Hickory, we have um, 20 primary care practices that represent about 56 clinical providers that are engaged with us on a regular daily basis for our medical home plans. We also operate 11 worksite clinics for that industry. And um, we're going to talk more um, when, I, when we come back around. I'll talk more about the details of how those clinics are administered on a regular basis. But the patient satisfaction surveys are positive as well as the financial results to date knock on wood somewhere. Great. Okay. Good morning. I'm Karen Smith, um, solo physician in Rayford, North Carolina for 24 years. We are PCMH level three, meaningful use um, stage two attestation has been completed. Um, <clears throat> I am here uh, mainly because of our love and interest of the population health utilizing uh, EHR technology. Uh, we enjoyed it so much. We found ourselves in Washington as part of the Office of the National Coordinator um, as a meaningful use vanguard. And so what we do is to assist other um, practices and physicians in understanding the importance of technology in healthcare 
and how do we implement it? How do we continue to move forward? We're excited about what directions our country will be going in in the next uh, maybe 10 to 15 years um, with the most recent legislation that's passed. We're on target, North Carolina is on target, and we look forward to the future. Good. Hello, my name is Kim Thrasher, and with an aim of full disclosure, I am not a physician. Mm -hmm. I am a clinical pharmacist, and I'm honored to represent community care of, North, of the Lower Cape Fear, which is one of the 14 networks of community care of North Carolina, which has been mentioned. Um, and um, with such, um, community care of uh, the Lower Cape Fear um, is one of the coordinated care organizations for the counties, the six counties in southeastern North Carolina, and um, we are currently headquartered in Wilmington, but have offices in um, Whiteville, um, which is in Columbus County. And um, I am, as I said, very honored to be here. Good morning, I'm Tom Workup. Uh, I'm the, a primary care physician and I lead a practice called Carolina Advanced Health, which is a prog progressive patient-centered medical home located here in Chapel Hill on the Durham side, where we focus and to try to maximize the team-based approach to take care of Ill people with illnesses that are such as diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, obesity, depression, and other chronic medical conditions. We're a partnership between Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina and UNC Healthcare Systems looking to and in this partnership, we're trying to collaborate on best ways to share information to maximize the care of our patients and to explore payment reform for primary care throughout North Carolina. And we're hoping to be part of that message. We've been open about three and a half years now, and we have uh, made some significant impacts on our patients' care access and quality metrics. We view population health through quality metrics. We track 22 quality metrics on a monthly basis. We report them out to a joint board between Blue Cross and UNC and uh, have some significant trends for reductions of uh, healthcare utilizations in ER, urgent care, and hospitalizations. Uh, the person that stimulated me or kind of incentive or kind of got me passionate about population health was Paul Grundy. Paul Grundy, one of the chief medical officers for the uh, IBM Global Initiative, really uh, kind of uh, incited me when I was at the Indian Health Service to do population management at a much larger level, and Carolina Advanced Health is that model in North Carolina. Good morning. My name is Thomas White. I'm a family physician from Cherryville, North Carolina, about an hour west of Charlotte, also known as Churville. Churville. Uh, in full disclosure, I uh, attended a school that uh, just won the men's national championship. <laughs> uh, also a known now as a one and done school. I, yeah. I tried to go pro after one year, <laughs> uh, but it didn't work out. Uh, uh, about 28 years ago, I returned to Cherryville to practice family medicine, uh, where I am now. I'm the president this year of the North Carolina Academy of Family Physicians. Uh, I'm most proud that I'm a new grandfather, and particularly proud that my son Daniel is here today. He's a second year medical student at UNC Chapel Hill. Yeah, good. Thank you. Uh, so one of the issues that everybody who looks at health care in America is concerned about is the kind of siloization of health care. If your problem is on the skin, there's one doctor for that. If it's an inch lower in the blood vessel, there's a different doctor for that. If it gets down to the bone, there's another doctor for that. But as a matter of fact, what we found is uh, a more coordinated, team-centered approach uh, tends to produce better health uh, at better cost. And a lot of that is going on in North Carolina. So I just want to talk to some of our docs here about how that's happening. So Tom Workup, could you tell us about how this team-centered work works at uh, Colorado, Colorado Advanced Health? Sure, I, I look at team-based approach. I, I break it into maybe three principal parts. One is uh, the team-based approach is first gonna be using the EHR. Uh, to give you a little bit of background, four years ago, four and a half years ago, when we started to conceptualize the practice, we were on, at UNC we were on an old legacy system called WebSys. 
And before we abandoned WebSys and moved to Epic, we had actually been able to build registries in the old system that allowed us to not only stratify patients based on their disease, but then more innovatively use biometrics to stratify them within that registry. So for diabetics, based on your depression score, which was innovative certainly to bring that in, your, uh, your A1C, which is a blood sugar over three months, your blood pressure numbers, a few other biometrics, you got stratified as a red patient, a yellow patient, or a green patient. And the need, and fortunately, when we went to Epic, we just passed our one year anniversary with Epic, was that for the first time they were able to replicate that within Epic. And what that allows us to do from a team based care is to then allow us to be more proactive and deploy our team. My team is I have a nurse, I have a PA, I have another physician, but then we have a PharmD, a clinical pharmacist. We also have a nutritionist, behavioral therapist, a psychiatrist, uh, and we also have a care manager. So that allows us to look at our stratifications of diabetics, hypertensives, depressive individuals, et cetera, and deploy our team in a more proactive manner. Our overarching theme is I'd like to be engaged but not be intrusive, and that sometimes is a, a fine balancing act. So utilizing the EHR to its maximum potential is one. Uh, huddling. So we feel very strongly that once a week, the provider meets with our care team that I just mentioned for one hour to go over pertinent patient information from that week. We go over any relevant hospitalization issues, transitions of care. We incorporate now chronic care initiatives that Medicare has just put out a payment modeling for, and also any referrals, and making sure that we're on top of where our patients go throughout the system. Uh, we look at ourselves as the navigator for their health care. And then lastly would be using the team-based approach to change our culture. The culture in medicine, for most of us on this panel, grew up in a sense that we had to be very autonomous, or were asked to be autonomous. And to give up some of that control to qualified care members of the team is not a learned behavior. It's not, a, not an inherent behavior. It must be learned. And I, I, we find it, uh, Ron and I actually work for the same organization, and we find that it's a struggle with some of our brethren to say that I want to give up that responsibility to my clinical pharmacist, or I'm going to give up some of that responsibility to my nutritionist. But to do that is truly patient-centered. It gives them what they need at the point of contact and allows them to be a far more educated patient, I believe. So the EHR maximization, huddling, and then really changing the culture so that way we feel more comfortable offloading it to very qualified team members to achieve the quality metrics that, we, that we're striving for. Thanks. And as uh, Tom said, when you take this uh, team-based approach, uh, the results are dramatic. Outcomes are better. Uh, costs are lower. Patients are more satisfied. And one place where this is happening that the whole nation is looking at is Granite Falls, North Carolina. And Dr. Bujold, would you tell us about what's happening there? Sure. Um, a year ago, we were going through our patient-centered medical home process, and one of the things that the process asked was how many patients we admitted to the hospital and have we decreased the number of patients we admitted to the hospital. So I had um, one of my staff run a report and she brought it to my desk and I looked at it and I thought this has to be wrong. And she said, no, I've done it twice and it's right. And over five years we had decreased our hospital admissions by 80%. And um, I knew I was, I, I admit all my own patients to the hospital and I knew that you know, we weren't admitting nearly as many patients as we had been before, but when I saw that number, I just about fell on the floor. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how that happened. Uh, about 10 years ago, we started on this path of transforming the practice. And in the process of doing that, I, I have 13 people that work for me, mostly full time. There are some that work part time. Um, but we added a PhD psychologist, um, we added a PharmD physical therapist, and a dietitian. Um, we also have a fairly elaborate uh, IT system that extracts data from patients uh, the night before we see them, 
and it allows us to see where gaps in care are for preventative care and also for chronic disease management like <coughs> diabetes and hypertension and COPD. Uh, probably the biggest thing, though, that we had to do is re-engineer the way everybody in the office works. Um, and now I act more like a CEO directing care. Um, I, I was able to release a lot of the things I used to do uh, to the PharmD and the psychologist and people like that. Um, all the decisions about patient care New hires, addition of services aren't made anymore without the um, input from the entire team. Um, I wouldn't think about making any kind of major change without asking the entire team to give me some input because it really affects everybody that works in a clinic. Um, as a result, everyone on the team feels like they're contributing employee morale is a lot higher, and everybody looks forward to coming into work every day, and there's a smile on everybody's face. And, and it's not an easy transition to make, but it's well worth the transition. In addition, we have aggressively worked with our <coughs> palliative care and hospice um, community, uh, proactively addressing end-of-life issues, um, and very much making that a patient-centered decision, which it needs to be, uh, with the families always in control of the process, and have found a lot of people, you know, that previously would have been in an ICU, um, and just, and I'm sure a lot of people in this room have been in that position where those issues weren't addressed, and you end up taking care of people that really don't want to be in those kind of positions because they were never asked the question. Um, so I thought sometimes it's best just to use an example as, of a patient, which we worked with recently, and a lot of this, a lot of people in this room can um, relate to, but there's a patient that I've taken care of for a long time, he's a 70-year-old white male, um, and had the typical <laughs> chronic diseases, COPD, coronary artery disease, insulin-dependent diabetes, mellitus, depression hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and he was addicted to nicotine. Well, what we did with that patient in this new model of care, we first brought in the dietitian and the PharmD, and he spent the first time he saw them three hours um, and really got a much better understanding of his diabetes. His sugars had been running three and 400. He didn't understand much about the process, the drugs, et cetera, et cetera. And then every um, week, usually two or three times a week, the PharmD would call him at home and ask him how things were doing. And now I can say that his blood sugars are in the 100 to 140 to 150 range and his diabetes is under much better control. I wasn't involved in that part of his care at all. You know, that was all on the PharmD and the dietitian. Um, the second thing we had to do is address his depression, his nicotine addiction, and so we sent him over to the, the PhD psychologist, and he spent several sessions with them. Turned out during that time he had just gotten married and he was having significant marital discord, and so we brought his wife in um, and worked with that and got that all straightened out. Um, and uh, with our physical therapist, we enrolled him in a pulmonary rehab program. And um, he got in much better shape. He's not um, smoking anymore. And lo and behold, he spends much less time in the emergency room and almost no time in the hospital. Wow. So. Ed, how do you bill for a three-hour consulting session? <laughs> Who pays for this? Um, that's a cost we eat right now. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Mary Hall, Dr. Hall, uh, you're doing the same kind of thing at uh, Health Education Carolinas and I3. Could you tell us about that? So actually, <clears throat> excuse me, those are great stories, Tom and Ed, and great definition of team-based care. I have several stories about how 
we have to prepare the next, excuse me, <clears throat> the next generation to do this work. And I'm going to start with an example that spans across North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. But first, just to level set a bit for the folks in the room, a medical student is somebody who is learning to be a physician. And when we in family medicine teach medical students, we're teaching all specialty, all eventual specialists about primary care and family medicine, because all doctors need to know about primary care and family medicine. And when they choose to specialize in family medicine, then they do their residencies with us. And so when I talk about the learners I'm talking about today are medical students and residents. However, we need to expand our students and learners to include PA and nurse practitioner students, pharmacy students, mental health students, behavioral health students, all students. And in fact, the licensing um, medical board for, for medical schools requires that students work in interprofessional teams. Now, it requires that they learn in interprofessional teams. So I just laid out all those students for you. But they're supposed to work in real teams. Well, those real teams don't exist functioning well in many places. And we've just heard two great examples. But we want all of our students to learn together so they become the workforce of the future, providing primary care to the people of our state and country. So one great example that we have is um, the I3 Collaborative. And it's, it's very fun to me in my career to sit on a panel and speak enthusiastically about a fabulous program that I had nothing to do with creating. So <clears throat> let me first make sure before I forget to introduce Warren Newton right there in front of me and next to him, Libby Baxley, who are the creators of this program. I know you have a big team and folks who have been in this work for 10 years, but I, you two, am I right, created this program together. So uh, Warren is um, Vice Dean at the UNC School of Medicine, Chair of Family Medicine, and AHAC Director Statewide. And Libby Baxley, when she created this program, was Chair of Family Medicine at the University of South Carolina, and is now one of those big deans, at, uh, two big deans, whatever we do in deanhood, uh, at um, ECU. <laughs> so thank you to both of them for being here. And tomorrow, I, I'm on the advisory board of the I3 Collaborative, and I'm going to say what it is in a minute. And we have our meeting tomorrow. And if these days were reversed, I'd know a whole lot more. But um, I'm going I'm to do the best I can. Um, I was involved. I was in, in a family medicine program at the, at the beginning. And so I was involved in, in the several first few years. Um, so I3 Collaborative is I to the third power, improvement on steroids. So improvement in practice, first the first part is that the residents, see, we need to train our learners um, for their future, the future we want them to be. We need to train them the way, which is really a moving target, as you know. Who knows what they need to be? But we're trying to stay on top of it. So the patients who are cared for by them in their practices receive the benefits of this, of this improved care. The communities around the residency programs who might be involved with the residency, their patients receive this improvement. And then, of course, when the residents go out into practice, we assume that everything they learn, they will bring to their practices. That's the improvement to the third level on steroids that we're doing. What a quality improvement project does, and I'm, 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 on the, I'm in the team section, so I better make sure I talk about teams, but quality improvement, what a, what a learning collaborative does is, is meet, they like each other, and. We have a lot of fun together, but that's not really why they're getting together. We, and we used to get together in the mountains. That was pretty. Um, so, <laughs> but the real reason we're getting together is to share um, learnings with each other. And the teams get together. And that's, that's the point. So we would drive up to wherever the twice a year meetings were. And you bring not just the physician. You know, family doctors, a, a lot of family doctors, we, I learned in teams. I wouldn't know how to practice medicine without a PharmD. The word, there was two or three years I did not have a PharmD in my practice, and I, uh, it was kind of rough. But we, we have incorporated and integrated behavioral health and pharmacy throughout, really, for, for a lot of years. We're just trying to make that more of a standard for all of, all of our practices. I worry sometimes about my residents who graduate and the patient starts crying, and they go look for the mental health professional in their practice, and, and they, you know, ah, they're not there. Yeah. So we have to be careful to prepare them for the future that exists now and the future that can be um, later. So the teams come together, and that's the physicians. That might be the nurse practitioner and PAs that are in the practice, uh, the, uh, or other nursing personnel, MAs the front office staff, so the practice manager. Anyone who has anything to do with the care of that patient comes together in these teams, in this learning collaborative, 
10 years ago, we focused on diabetes and heart failure. And 10 years ago, we showed, I, I, we showed definitely a reduction in hospitalizations, ED visits, and overall improvement in care. So this is about objective, measured outcomes in care. We transformed um, to patient-centered medical home, and at that point, we became attractive to in our internal medicine and pediatric primary care colleagues. And the goal of that collaborative was to get uh, patient-centered medical home. And now, currently, the collaborative is focused on the triple aim. We have, and for folks, it's been stated once, but I'll state it again, um, it's the triple aim is about providing better health outcomes, a better patient care experience at lower cost. So we, this now includes, I mean, Libby and Warren, if you want to talk to them afterwards and bow down, um, it now includes 27 practices in three states who come together to prepare their residents to graduate and, be, and think that this kind of care is normal. And so they each choose one of those three things to focus on, I think, if I get these details wrong, forgive me. But one, one thing, uh, some of the group I sat in on w was to decrease utilization of care, to decrease, um, to increase, you know, pay, pay primary care visits, but to decrease the use of, of high cost um, imaging studies and to decrease emergency department visits and to decrease hospitalizations, to decrease referrals. And that's always tricky. You know, I, now I'm in my world where I, I go over to see my patients at family medicine to breathe a little, but I'm in a world with, with a lot of other specialists and they take great care of patients too. But, but sometimes what they think is an indicated test isn't necessarily what we think is an indicated test. So lots of work though do, being done across the country started with the American Board of Internal Medicine to look at choosing wisely, the choosing wisely campaign, to look at ordering tests and referring um, to, to other specialists um, when it was indicated and when evidence said that that was the thing to do. And those referrals and tests and labs, we need to order. But other things, we don't need to order. If it's not been proven to be effective, it will just be an, not just an added financial cost, but an added health cost to the patient when there are, are bad outcomes or un, un, unanticipated um, outcomes. So that's the work of this team meeting twice a year, webinars every month, sharing data, uploading data, learning from each other, making improvements, studying the effect of those improvements, and then hopefully putting out a bunch of doctors who know what to do with their teams. And the three states are the two Carolinas? Uh, Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and last time I was there was somebody there from Florida, so watch out. Yeah, maybe Georgia will jump in too, it would be useful. It'll be smart. Thank you, thanks. Um, so, uh, Team-based care, getting a bunch of people, getting the psychologist in because somebody in addition to other health problems is addicted to nicotine. It, we've seen this work and the striking thing is in each of these cases it's the primary care doc who's kind of the hub who centers this, which doesn't surprise me at all because uh, primary care doctors really put the patient at the center of care. When I got into health policy, it was fairly recently for me, and <clears throat> patient-centered care and patient-centered medical home, these are big buzzwords in American health policy now, and I didn't get it. Isn't all health care supposed to be patient-centered? Isn't that what it's for? Uh, as a matter of fact, a lot of health policy in America is for doctors and for hospitals and for insurance companies, whereas primary care doctors see their patient not as a broken bone, not as an injured organ, a diseased organ, but as a person, as a human being. Uh, we've heard here this fairly common refrain, it's absolutely true, that when you focus on primary care, you get better outcomes for less money. And I learned that when I was studying health policy. I heard that when I went around the world, but I didn't understand the mechanism, you know, how does that work? I didn't know about treating this guy with multiple problems in Granite Falls. North Carolina, but I discovered in my own case, I'll tell you what happened. Uh, did I mention I'm from Colorado? I'm from Colorado, and uh, I think it's in our state constitution that we all have to be skiers. We're all pretty <laughs> serious about this. I'm a serious skier and snowboarder. And uh, recently, um, in January, uh, one Monday night, we had a huge snow dump. It was just a big dump in the mountains. And of course, Tuesday morning, me and my snowboard were up there enjoying this new powder. It was great, my friends and I. And uh, came home, it was an ordinary day. I'm, I'm not the world's greatest 
fall now and then, and uh, came home, and the next morning I woke up and my thigh was purple. My thigh was purple, it looked disastrous, it was scary, what the heck's going on? It didn't hurt or anything. But you know, it's a little upsetting if you're not a doctor to see your thigh is purple, and it didn't hurt, so I figured it'll go away, and I woke up the next morning, it was worse. Now my whole leg was purple, and my daughter saw it and said, my God, Dad, you're, you got serious problem here. Get to the hospital, get an MRI, you know, go see some specialist about this. Your leg is disgusting, you know? And, uh, <laughs> And of course, I'm not a doctor. I, what, what, who do you go see for a purple leg? A dermatologist? <laughs> Oncologist? I mean, I had no idea, but I do know one doctor. My family doc in Denver, Grady Holder, is a member of the American Academy of Family Physicians. Uh, he knows me. I know him. He knows me. And uh, so I went in to see Grady Holder, and uh, I said, Doc, my leg is, is terrible, and let me see. And, I showed him my leg. He said, okay, pull your pants up. After about five seconds, he says, you're fine. You're fine. What do you mean? My leg is purple. What do you mean? And he said, he knows me. He knows me as a person. He said, aren't you a snowboarder? Yeah. And wasn't there a big dump on Monday night? I bet you went up there yesterday, two days ago. And did you take a fall? Well, yeah, I always fall. And uh, he said, yeah, you broke a blood vessel. And that's what the purple is. It's going to heal itself. You don't have to do anything. A week from now, your leg's going to look normal. If it doesn't, give me a call and come on back. Well, you know, and he was right. Of course he was right. I felt fine. I went home, and when I told my daughter not to worry, it was fine. That visit cost me about 20 bucks copay. It probably cost my insurance company another 60, 70 bucks. What if I'd gone in for an MRI? It would have been $2,000 in Colorado. Uh, because this doctor knew me, and treated me as a person, I got good health at lower cost. And this is how this mechanism works over and over, all over. Um, and this is why primary care doctors in particular are promoting patient-centered medical care, or the, you ready for the, you know, Zachman and PCMH, the patient-centered medical home. And one of the places in North Carolina was this is where this is happening is in Hickory, where Kathy Pettit, has been working with her industry to create this kind of care. Can you tell us about it? Absolutely. So I guess the question in your mind is why would industry be implementing patient-centered medical homes? How did you find out about it? How did you get involved in it? And believe me, some of, of the people around my table at the Board of Directors ask me that question all the time. Remind us why we're doing this, please. Um, although they do know, know the answer to that. Um, there are two um, real prevalent issues that are facing manufacturing in our community today. One is that we have a rapidly aging population. Um, if we look back at our data 10 years ago, we kept our employee, average employee age around um, 38 to 40 years old. Fast forward today, that average age of our employee population is in the mid to late 40s, because we're not hiring 20-year-olds to come into Hickory, North Carolina to work in manufacturing. So for some of the history, if you go back to early 2000, um, um, we were very productive, selling a lot of furniture, a lot of mansion builders out there, um, high-end furniture was going out, you know, as faster than we could produce it. And employers said, we got to keep people at work. They're, they're, they're signing out to go to the doctor and they're doing all these things. We got to keep them here. What do we do? So the answer at that period in time was to put in a, um, find a vendor in the community, bring them in and put in a uh, nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant. And they could go down on the clock, get seen and get back on the production line, get back to work, right? So we did that. Um, for a period of anywhere from 8 to 12 years in various employers that we work with. Um, 2008, with the economic downturn, um, it really created the perfect storm for us to start addressing several issues. One was, when we looked at our data, we knew that not only was our population aging, but also the health status of that population was diminished. We also looked at that data and determined that less than 20% of our population were seeing a primary care physician. So they were going to the worksite clinics that we were providing um, for acute care visit. They'd go down if they didn't feel well, they'd get an antibiotic, they'd go back to work. Um, and then what happened, there was a big gap between worksite clinic services and high-end specialty or intensive care services. 
So we really were not keeping patients in what would be a normal continuum of care. They were going for acute episodic care and then walking into pretty catastrophic events. Also at that period of time, we had one employer in 2009 that was looking at a significant renewal, which means um, his cost had gone up significantly that year compared to previous years. And when we drilled down and looked at that data, and this company is Vanguard Furniture, and that's really who I'm going to talk about today. Vanguard is a, um, they've been in operation for 42 years, privately held, family owned and operated company today. Um, and everybody in the workforce knows the owner of the company and talks to him freely and he walks through. And um, John at John Bray is the owner. And we were sitting down looking at his data and we had two cases in his claims experience for that year, for the year of 2008. Um, he spends about $10 million in health care cost, not administrative cost. $10 million was spent on health care that year. And of that $10 million, um, almost 9% of it, $900,000 was spent on two people. One was a female that was in her early 40s who had never had a mammogram. She had never had a mammogram even though twice that year we had pulled, had the hospital pull up a mobile mammography unit in front of the work site for free of charge. You don't have to clock out. You can get a mammogram. She had never had one. We also had a colon cancer that was diagnosed in um, very advanced stages as a result of somebody going, of a gentleman going to the emergency room. He was in his 60s. Not only had he not had a colonoscopy, we had no record of him ever having seen a physician or any encounter with the healthcare system in eight years of data that we had. So those two cases caused um, the owner of Vanguard Furniture to say to us, we have to have a solution. I cannot continue to impose on all of my workforce increased out-of-pocket and increased um, money that they're going to have to spend for those folks that are doing the right things, that are trying to take care of themselves and, to, and address their health and wellness issues. We, because other people are not responsible, we have to have a solution. The time that he said that was really coincided with the time we had two projects going on in our organization. One was we were doing a lot of research and working with folks in Washington at the um, Patient-Centered Primary Care Collaborative to learn more about patient-centered medical home. And we were also working with some of our health insurance brokers <coughs> on health savings account and consumer-driven plans. So we um, really got on steroids to say which of these models makes the most sense for where we're going to go. And at the end of the day, John Bray said, patient-centered medical home makes sense to me. That's exactly what I want to pay for, and that's what I want to offer. He said there's some differences, though. I, he, he believed in the principles, fundamentally believes in all the principles of patient-centered medical home. But he said, our approach is going to be different. Our approach is going to be, we're going to offer everybody a standard PPO plan. If you want to be in this plan, here's your premium, here's your out-of-pocket, your deductible cost. You can do what you want to, but you're going to pay significantly more out of your pocket to do that. If you want to be in our patient-centered medical home plan, we're going to offer you a very low premium. You're not going to pay anything for prevention, wellness. Now, this was before the ACA required those to be 100% services, right? We implemented that several years before we were required to. Um, he said, we're going to pay for all of those services. We're going to pay for you to have a colonoscopy. 100% it's going to be paid for. We're going to, we're going to um, pay for any visits with a primary care physician um, for chronic condition management. We're going to make this really easy for you. There are going to be no barriers for anybody in this population to get primary care services. The other thing um, that we did to implement the plan was we said this model that we've had in existence for several years now of putting um, physician assistants and nurse practitioners on the work site has to go away. The employees rebelled against it going away. It is perceived as their number one benefit to be able to walk into a clinic on their work site. So we knew that had to be continued, but we decided it had to be continued with primary care physicians in our local community. They, the, they could not be physician assistants, nurse, nurse practitioners that were being supervised by somebody three states over and reported to some vendor that we saw once a quarter with reports. They had to be associated and connected and managed through our local primary care physicians. So we went in the community and we had a large event and so to all of our primary care physicians, we invited everybody and said, here's what we want to do, why we want to do it, who's on board. 
Um, Ed Bujol, as a matter of fact, is one of our, our medical home um, physicians with one of our plans. Um, when we did that, the response was, um, it was all over the table. We had some physicians that wanted to learn more. We had um, some that said, wait and see, I'm trying to get certified. We had one group of primary care physicians that represented uh, five locations. They had 19 physicians. They had, they had diversity among their physician base. And they said, we will do this for you. And the reason we're of value to you is that we have a single electronic medical record. And whether we see your patient at your worksite clinic or we see them in the office environment, we will know everything that goes on with them. And we will also offer you 24-7 access. They can call it and get one of us on the telephone before they go to the emergency room. John Bray, who owns Vanguard Furniture, said, it's a deal. That's exactly what I want to have done. We implemented the plan and worked around the table with the physicians to do that at the time. Um, we still meet with them on a regular basis. We're all the time talking to that group of physicians about how we improve this plan, how we make it more successful. And one of the things that has been the most um, profound testimonial, I think, to us is a physician that is, um, he's 40, he just turned 45, and he said to us about two years into the plan there, he said, this has changed the way I practice, this has made me change the way I practice medicine. He's at the worksite clinic, and he said he has learned so much about what the population wants from their primary care physician. He's learned better about how to engage with that patient, and he says it's changed the way he practices back when he's in his, in his office environment. And we think that's pretty phenomenal to hear a physician say that to us. Um, the other thing that is important to know is that for the health plan, the financial results have been astounding. The first year, um, Vanguard Furniture invested over $2 million in primary care just to get people in to have a physical exam and to get their prevention and wellness um, up to date. So it was a pretty significant investment. And in that year, their cost went down over 30%. Wow. So it, and again, over a five-year trend, we still have a positive return on the financial investment that has been made. The way the plan works is um, everybody starts out by having a health risk assessment because it was important to our physicians. They said, we want to know where we start. You're giving us this whole, um, this large captive population. Where do we start? And keep in mind that new plans start on January 1, and they said, Kathy, we, can, we can't do all these thousands of physicals for you in three months. It's flu season. We don't do physicals that way. We said, okay, we're, we're, we're kind of reasonable. Can you get them done by June? And they said, um, well, let's risk stratify the population. And that's what we did. Everybody went through a health risk assessment that included general um, biometrics and also a glucose and a lipid. And from there, we identified our high risk patients, our moderate risk, and our low risk. Anybody that was a smoker or had ever had a diagnosis of diabetes or presented with a high glucose automatically was forced into the high risk population. Those folks had to get their physical done, a comprehensive physical done um, at an earlier date, and then we went to the moderate and the low risk. We do not define for our clin clinicians what a physical exam is. It is up to that, clini that clinician to decide what is appropriate for a physical exam. We're not clini clinicians and we don't dictate any clinical policy to them whatsoever. Um, but what we do provide them that they say has been of extreme value is we provide a plan that says to the member, if you're not in um, compliance with clinical recommendations, you will have to be moved over to a standard PPO plan, which comes with a much higher premium and cost out of your pocket. So there is, a, there is an incentive for them to not only identify a medical home provider that they are comfortable engaging with, but it is also in their financial incentive that they pay attention to what that primary care physician is asking them to do. And I just want to qualify that we're not asking them to do anything that's not reasonable. Um, they have to have a comprehensive physical exam annually or as required by their physician. So if a physician sees someone that is young and healthy and they think I don't need to see them for two or three years, they can release them from that gap of care and we ask no questions. They also have to have, um, if they are diabetic, they have to have all minimum standards of diabetic care, including their retinal eye exam, which one of our primary care group now brings the camera on the work site and so that they can line up and get it done without clocking out of work to have, to have that service provided. Um, additionally, they have to have a colonoscopy, mammogram, pap smear as, again, required by their physician, and PSA as required by their physician.
position because I know there's some, some um, difference of opinions about when those services are due. So the plan, um, if when we survey the population, the two most um, telling pieces of information that we get back from them um, from the surveys is that one, today compared to pre-medical home plans, our population feels that they are in better health. The second thing that they tell us that is pretty profound is that they feel they have a physician that listens to them. So um, that plan in itself has been so successful that, like I said in the introduction, we have since rolled out other plans and they all work the same way with Vanguard being, because it's our first plan, they are always more mature and they're farther along. Um, in June of this year, we will be having behavioral health that will be fully integrated with their um, medical home providers at the worksite clinic with them. Because one of the greatest challenges that the physicians have are a non-compliant patient. Why, you know, if somebody's non-compliant, nobody really wants to put them on a standard plan and increase their premium. What we want to do is figure out why aren't they compliant and how can we get them to a compliant state. So they will now have a behavioral health team that will be right there at the work site. So the message to the population is not that you've got health care benefits, medical, and over here you've got behavioral health. It's just you have a medical health plan and you have a team that's here to address your issues. So um, we're really excited to integrate the behavioral health. The other um, um, process that's in place now is a three-year plan where the culture at Vanguard and the other companies will be one of wellness. And um, if any of you know anything about manufacturing, I will tell you that it is a really tough environment to take to a no smoking campus. And uh, Vanguard did that uh, and did it successfully. Uh, it used to be my greatest pet peeve that I would go over to start and to wrap up the smoking cessation class and, and the people that were leaving the class had to walk through where all the folks yeah, were out yeah, having their smoking yeah, break. Yeah, yeah. And I thought this, this has got to be changed. So Vanguard is the only one so far in our community that has gone to non-smoking, but I suspect we will have others. Now we do see them across the parking lot and uh, across the, they go out the gates of the company, they leave, clock out, go out the gates and across the street to the church parking lot if they want to smoke. And that's okay because now we know exactly who they are and they pay the smoker premium to do that. Ah, uh, uh. <laughs> right. So that, 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 that is our story, and we'll be open to questions later. Kathy, when, when um, Vanguard offered the traditional insurance plan or the medical home, how many people took the old one? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm sorry I didn't say that. We have 99% of people in the medical home plan. It is, it is priced to drive participation to the medical home plan. And this uh, CEO sounds pretty, pretty informed. Was he or did you train him? Um, no, no, I can't take any credit for that. He oh. is, um, John Bray is incredibly um, informed about health care. In fact, I am very fortunate to have a board of directors that sits around my table. And, and they're there because, for the most part, um, they all own the companies. So it's, it's their money that's being spent on health care. It's not just another assignment that they have. Um, it's, they're actually looking at it not only from what am I spending on health care, but what is happening to my population again, because they know that they're getting older and that what we were seeing for a number of years with it was that their health risk was, was increasing and, and not going the right direction. <coughs> their risk in, index today of the population is trending downward just because of getting them engaged with their primary care. How many employees there? Um, at Vanguard today, there's 750 locally. We have 6,000 members now in medical, 6,000 employees in medical home plans. Um, that means 6,000 belly buttons. I don't know how to count employee plus four or employee plus five or employee yeah. plus nine. Um, so the number's probably upwards of 12,000 that are enrolled across the, the whole plan. Uh, I just want to thank you, Kathy. I just want to say again, if you have a question, write it down, and uh, we'll we'll pass it right on. Uh, now, there's a real another good story about uh, using a team approach to get people healthier from uh, from Cape Fear, from uh, down around Wilmington, North Carolina, and uh, Kim Thrasher is going to tell us about that. Thank you. As I mentioned earlier, I'm one of the representatives from Community Care of North Carolina. And for those of you who don't know, and there's so much that I would love to tell you about CCNC, um, but I'll try to be succinct. It is an organization of physicians, pharmacists, nurses as care managers, behavioral health specialists, and I hope I don't lose or 
um, leave anyone out. Um, and we are um, have formed a car- partnership with the state of North Carolina and initially established in 1998 to provide coordinated care to primarily the Medicaid population. And um, as such, I am um, with Community Care of the Lower Cape Fear, which is um, covers the six counties in southeastern North Carolina. And CCNC, in general, has um, had has, is working with about 6,000 of our primary care physicians across the state, and that represents about 90% of our primary care providers. And um, they choose to be working with us, and I think that's an important statement as well. So through my work with CCLCF, which is Community Care of the Lower Cape Fear, Um, I work, as mentioned, with physicians and care managers and the patients. And um, we had some special funding um, shortly after I got there, which was about three years ago. And this allowed me to go into some of the local practices or be embedded in some of the local practices. One was a solo practice in Whiteville, and down there they pronounce it Whiteville. Um, and I love that. And the other practice was in Elizabethtown, which is in Bladen County. And if you've seen some of the recent health statistics, Columbus County and Bladen County are not the healthiest counties in North Carolina. But that's the one of the beauties of CCNC is we are across all, we we work out of all 100 counties um, across the state. And um, with the special funding, as I said, I was able to go in and um, be able to provide real-time comprehensive medication reviews for many of the patients. And there's one special patient which, um, when we were asked to um, to participate in this um, event today, they said, tell us about some of the patients. And I immediately thought of this one patient that initially the care manager had come to me and said, need some help. We have this patient who we're engaged with and she's engaged with us. And she's been told to have some nutritional supplements. Can't afford them. And so I'm a pharmacist, I'm not a nutritionist. (laughs) But I had been in that situation before with what do we do with alternatives. And so I went in and she was, the patient was very gracious to allow me to um, interview her. And by that I mean she's known her primary care physician, Dr. Rich, for year after year after year. And I was this new person. So she was very kind to let me interview her and ask, ask her about her medications. and. And she had been several times hospitalized. She had a couple of chronic disease states uh, or conditions. And she had been hospitalized. She had gone to urgent cares. And it was overwhelming. And she needed to have this central um, group of people with whom she could work. And she found that with us. And it was... Um, at that point that we didn't try to change her life overnight. And we started to take steps. She had concerns about her stamina and and her breathing. And so we took certain steps, and it wasn't everything at once. And with that, um, I can now look back and, and I can look at, through Community Care of North Carolina, we have this great electronic um, health record, which not only are we, do we have access to some of the medical records, but we also have access to the patient's fill claims in their pharmacies. And this is very important to us for when we um, look and provide a medication review. And this patient has one of the most beautiful fill histories I've ever seen. We got her engaged. We She And that's another thing, if I can interrupt, is I think too often we concentrate when we are talking to a patient about this is your condition and this is ways that we're going to treat the condition with medications. And too often we automatically go to the risks of the therapy. 
And do we concentrate at all on the risks of not going on the therapy? And so we talked to her about this, the benefits and risks of whether she went on, on the medications or whether she did not. And she chose to go on the medications. And she's got one of the most beautiful fill histories every 30 days. And I'm so proud of her. <laughs> and she is thriving. And she is absolutely thriving. And when the patient thrives, we all thrive. And it's, I have, again, I have so much more to tell you, but um, I, I would really like to introduce our care team. Um, we have Ms. Tanya Suggs, who is our care manager. And we have Dr. Chuck Rich, who's our physician. And we have Ms. Sylvia, patient. our patient. <laughs> And we, who, she is accompanied by her niece, Miss Priscilla. <laughs> and Miss Priscilla, I mean, excuse me, Miss Sylvia, if there is anything that you would like to share about your experience with us, we invite you to do so. a lot with me. I have been very, very sick. And they have brought in many times to discuss different things with me, which also is like Tanya. I have a booklet here that was given me managing my health care. And everything I need to know or I have to do is in this book. Like if I need to speak with Dr. Rich about something that I don't remember, I can write it down and when I get there, all I have to do is look in my little book. The same thing about anything that I have to do, all I have to do is go into my little book. And I have my information. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Kim, what does the care manager do? Do we still have the... <laughs> Tanya? Um, there's not a lot that they don't do, but I'd really love Tanya to address that question. Basically, what we do when our patients um, are in the hospital, we go in. <laughs> um, basically, when they're um, in the hospital, we'll go in and review their medications, get a list of what's actually in the home. Usually that's what I prefer. We can see them in the practice when they're there, but going into the home and actually sitting down in the patient's environment and um, their surroundings, um, we get a better feel for the patient's routine, their schedule. Um, it, it just seems like it's more of a per personal approach to actually be there sitting. And we educate them about their disease process, um, try to make sure that they adhere to the medication, um, uh, talk to them about diet, their doctor's appointments, their follow-up care, uh, discharge instructions, that kind of thing. And we provide contact information. So if they have questions, um, they are certainly welcome to um, call us. And we just kind of like keep them in the loop with their um, the team, with the pharmacist, with the primary care provider, try to um, make sure that they know how to manage their care and they have resources. They know what their resources are. And you put together a book like that for each patient? The company does. Um, CCLCF, they do. They, they put a booklet together, and we give that on every visit to our patients, along with a pill tray, like to organize a weekly um, pill tray, and also a medication bag to put their pills in to um, oh, take to tray. the provider's office, the pill bottles. If I could add, one of the activities that, as a clinical pharmacist, that we provide when we're not in the practice is... Um, when the care manager goes to the patient's home, which is the true setting of where they are or are, it, are not adherent, um, we get that information. We also have, again, as I said, we have a very extensive um, electronic system that we get the fill history, we get the discharge list, and we get the, in, if we call it the home inventory, 
of, from the, the care manager. And what we find mm -hmm. from that, because we will do a full review of that, and for so many patients, they have their medicines that they were taking before they went into the hospital, and then they're given this new list. And it's amazing how much we will find. And, and not only do we do that to, to um, uncover any discrepancies between lists and what the patient is actually taking, but we also provide an aspect of, of just an additional pair of eyes for that evidence-based medicine approach. So if I see a patient who has a history of diabetes, and I'll, I might pro that might prompt me to ask the question if I don't see an, a patient with a particular type of medicine, um, such as an ACE inhibitor or a statin, um, that I'll, I'll add that to the medication review. I will then submit that to the primary care provider. Hopefully, the goal is that that's done before the hospital follow-up with the PCP or the primary care provider. And so that is another um, bit of evidence, or not evidence, but a bit of information that the PCP or the physician can use once that patient is there upon hospital follow-up. And so it, it's just another piece of the puzzle to provide better care. It's, a, again, part of that team-based approach. We're all there um, centered on the patient. And then the, we ask that the pro provider submit comments back on the um, issues that we uncovered that revolved around their drug therapy. We review those, and then we get that information back to the care manager, who can again get that information back to the to the patient. So if a patient wasn't taking a medicine that we want them to be on, then that's um, communicated back to them. So it really closes that um, any gaps in the care from the patient who's been trans transitioned home. And additionally, we do this also for the, those with chronic disease statement. Tanya, do you ever find a patient has pills in the home you don't want them taking? <laughs> yes, sir. That's, that's a kind of a common thing. It, it's what we call the discrepancies of the medications that they were sent home from the hospital with something different than what the primary care doctor had originally prescribed them. Sometimes it's very, um, we do a preliminary med review, like we'll get a list of what they were discharged on and can compare it with their field history. So a lot of times we uncover a lot of, you know, medications that have potentials for causing another readmission if we don't catch it soon, get collaboration. If you're in the home and you find a carton of cigarettes or a lot of liquor, can do you do anything about you that? Have or choose your battles. <laughs> what? You really have to choose your battles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. When I was uh, reporting in France, they do this kind of thing in in France. As soon as the line turns blue on your pregnancy test, a home health visitor goes and visits once a week for the next nine months. And I was talking to this one expectant mother, and she said, oh, I hate that woman. I hate that woman. Why? Because <laughs> she comes in and she goes through the drawers and finds the cigarettes and takes them away. She didn't like that at all. But that's, uh, that's the kind of involvement that a primary care doctor can oversee, and it really advances health, as Sylvia has told us. Uh, which gets us to another, I think, uh, key point, particularly in a state like yours or mine with large rural and low-income areas, and that is uh, health care is not just going to the doctor and getting treatment or getting a pill. Uh, health care has to start with the patient. It has to involve getting patients to take responsibility for their own health. What do we call this? Wellness, preventive health, community health programs. And very commonly in our country, it's the primary care doctor who is the sort of the overseer that, the manager that, the, uh, the supervisor of patients taking care of themselves. And uh, in, uh, what do you call it, Cherville? In Turval, uh, Dr. White has been doing a lot of that as a way to keep his patients healthy before they get to him. Can you tell us about it? Sure. Thank you. Uh, I think it's often said that our country may be uh, the best disease care 
country in the world, but we fall very short as far as having the best health care. Uh, other than the dreaded purple leg syndrome, um, I'm not sure that there's any disease state that lends itself better to the triple aim than cardiovascular disease. We really fail miserably um, when it comes to the prevention of cardiovascular disease in this country. We've done better. There has actually been a fairly significant reduction in death from cardiovascular disease. Interestingly, when that's been analyzed, about 90% of that reduction is actually attributable to the identification and acting upon risk factors. And that's primarily done by primary care folks out in the community. So of the success that we have had with cardiovascular disease, and there's much more to be done. About 90% is the identification and acting upon risk factors. It's not stents, bypass surgery, implanted defibrillators that has reduced deaths primarily from cardiovascular disease. It's always been an interest of mine and in prevention. And I think that for all the other primary care folks in this audience uh, today, I think that's one thing we have in common is a focus on prevention. Um, our healthcare system has unfortunately valued and focused on the treatment of disease. Now, I, in my work and interest in cardiovascular disease a few years ago, I came across something very interesting. And that is that the most common cause of death among firefighters is actually cardiovascular disease, sudden cardiac death. And you may think that when you're talking about firefighters, the most common cause of death would be injury or accident from a fire, but it's not. The number one cause is an acute cardiovascular event, a heart attack, occasionally a stroke. So we lose about 100 firefighters in this country every year, uh, and about half of those are due to an acute heart attack. You may not think that's a big number. It, it, it actually really is a big number, and it has huge consequences. Uh, for one thing, two-thirds of those deaths occur going to a fire call, at a fire call, or returning back to the fire department. So imagine that when that happens, a firefighter goes down, and it's happening going to a fire, at the fire, or returning. Right there, your home, your life, your children, your grandchildren, your property are endangered. Fire teams responding to your fire aren't over, um, uh, the, the team is not overstocked, they're limited. And so when someone goes down at that moment, it puts everyone at risk. Uh, so there's some immediate consequences. But the other is it's very costly. It's costly to replace a firefighter, it's costly uh, uh, to the department, it's costly to the community. Uh, so I came across this uh, phenomenon about firefighters and I decided I would look into it further and I decided in my small town that where I could start would be my local uh, fire department. We're very blessed in Cherryville to have one of the absolutely best fire departments in the state of North Carolina. It's been recognized statewide and nationally in a lot of ways. Uh, it's a fire department of about 40 firefighters. And by the way, if you remember nothing else that I tell you today, it's firefighters, not firemen, okay? So remember that when you go back to your communities. Now, in, I'm very, very, um, very honored that two of our firefighters from Cherryville are here today. I'd like for them to stand and be recognized. Uh, Mr. Jason Walford, Mr. Derek Mackey. <laughs> These guys are real, real heroes. Um, uh, and and I, sort of an aside, I think it's also important to point out that that, that firefighters, and these guys in particular, are incredible role models, really, for what we're talking about today. They don't spend a lot of their time actually dealing with an actual fire event, right? That happens really infrequently. They spend 
a great deal of their time focused on prevention. They spend time reminding us that we need to have batteries in our smoke alarms. They visit businesses and make sure that fire safety is adhered to. By doing their job, they benefit us economically. Uh, our insurance rates depend on how good a job they do in prevention. So there are a lot of similarities between what they do and what we're striving to do in healthcare. So here's what I did. I went into our local fire department and we did a screening, a risk assessment, as has been mentioned before. We looked at lifestyle, we looked at blood pressures, we did laboratory testing, and we gathered data. Each of the firefighters were provided with that data, and each of their primary care physicians, if it wasn't me, was provided with the same data. Uh, virtually every firefighter in the department, and I sat down and went over their results and laid out a plan that they could take back to their primary care physician, if it, again, if it wasn't me. So what did we learn from that, just to summarize? We actually learned that uh, they have a, there's a high, high uh, risk of diabetes among this small and fairly young group. We found that they had fairly well controlled blood pressures. Uh, we found that their cholesterol levels actually on the surface looked pretty good, but when we did detailed testing, we found other worrisome signs. About half of the firefighters had signs of inflammation in their arteries. In other words, the potential for having sticky arteries, sticky arteries that could result in a sudden heart attack. Uh, so we provided information, feedback, and then each of them began to lay out a plan. Uh, if I could go back just a minute and address the issue, because you may be wondering, why do firefighters have this risk of a sudden heart attack? They actually have about a 300-fold risk of heart disease and about a 100-fold risk of sudden cardiac death compared to the general population. And the reasons are, first of all, they actually have more diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol problems, than the average, the general population. We didn't find all that in our small study, but we did find this significant risk of diabetes. Uh, but coupled with those risk factors that are in place, firefighters are exposed to something that none of us will probably ever experience, and that is they, they live and work in a situation where their diets are often uh, very, very, controlled by their circumstances. They often live on fast food. They have to. They have to be very nimble and always ready uh, to move. Uh, they, going to a fire event or at the fire event, they're exposed to a lot of physical and psychological stressors. Uh, heat, noise, they're at high risk of dehydration, and they're, maybe the most significant is this phenomenon of the adrenaline rush that occurs. So if you take those traditional risk factors and you put it with those unique circumstances of firefighters, it's no wonder, it's no wonder that if a firefighter has a, 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 a narrowing in a coronary artery plaque and it's inflamed, it's sticky, and it can rupture, that's how the sudden cardiac death occurs. We learned a lot from this study. We learned the importance of lifestyle. We learned that a group like this can actually take this information and they, they can do something with it. And that's, I think, what I was most proud of in my working with our local fire department. Uh, we sat down as a group and said, a small group, firefighters, myself, and said, what are we gonna do with this information? We know the statistics, we know the risk, what are we gonna do? And so they, they laid out what we were going to do, that we were going to promote more exercise uh, within the department. So firefighters in the department reported on a regular basis what their exercise regimen was. They began to weigh themselves, uh, and they actually suggested forming a biggest loser contest uh, within the department. Uh, the winner of that contest is actually 
one of the two firefighters here today, uh, Derek Mackey. I, I think he deserves to stand back up. <laughs> now, we had 35 participants in this study, and in the first two months after we did the testing, the counseling, uh, our campaign within the department, the department lost 62 pounds as a group in the first two months. Now, interestingly, after losing 62 pounds, the summer came. Now, during the summer, they don't meet as regularly because of vacations. And so they regained some weight. They regained some weight. And so we learned that, that to firefighters, teamwork is incredibly important all the time. But it, it's particularly important in changing the trajectory that they were on. So once the summer was over and they resumed their monthly meetings, we saw those numbers turn back in the right direction. I think, again, uh, this, uh, this project that I've done with the firefighters, you may think, well, that's a small group. That's a bit esoteric. Uh, it's not. I really think it, it captures what we need to do in the prevention of cardiovascular disease, and that is look at risk factors, look at lifestyle, act upon those, get patients engaged, and we as primary care physicians can do that. And in fact, primary care physicians, family physicians across the state are doing community projects like this every day. They may be team physicians, they may be involved with local scouts, they may be giving lectures to rotary clubs, they're doing education intervention just like I did in this project every day. And that's one of the values of primary care. It's what we do every day in our communities. And this is simply one example. So thanks for letting me share my story. Yeah. Great. So do you, do you find other fire departments come in and to see how you're doing this? So we have started, um, we started doing that. We've actually taken this message on the road and given it, uh, presented our study in some other states. We're just beginning now to uh, uh, query all of our departments in the state of North Carolina to find out what they do. Um, unfortunately, medical evaluations for firefighters are recommended but not required. You may think that they would be required. They're not. There's very poor funding and it's very inconsistent the kind of evaluation that they get. The career firefighters typically get uh, a, a fuller, more consistent evaluation than the volunteers. We have 57,000 firefighters in the state of North Carolina and three-fourths of them are volunteer. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, so we're looking around the state at all the departments just begun that process to find out what others are doing, what best practices there are, uh, and hope to share what we think are some best practices that we have established. Uh, so Tom, you're the doctor, and when you say to your patient it's your responsibility to take care of your health, do, you, do they buy this or do they say that's your job? Mm. That's a good question. Um, uh, I, I would like to um, develop over time with each of my patients, and I think all primary care physicians in this room, develop really a partnership. That we're, we're in this together. It's not just you and your fault if something happens. It's not just me and my fault if something happens to you. We're in this together. Um, in fact, I could go on about firefighters, but the really cool thing about firefighters, they have this slogan. Uh, two in, two out. In other words, when one goes into a fire event, they go in with another firefighter. And their responsibility to each other is to come out together. And that's really how we ought to look at primary care and health care, right? Great. Is your clinician and your patient, you're in this together. Two in, two out. You have a responsibility to each other. Um, and I think that's pretty good to remember. Yeah, I love that. That's fabulous. Yeah. So, do police departments have the same kind of uh, health problems? So, it, there have been some comparative studies, and the risk of sudden cardiac death is significantly higher among firefighters than police 
EMS workers and other emergency workers. So that, that has been compared. Um, uh, so, um, and there's, again, as I mentioned earlier, there's some very unique, uh, unique features to being a firefighter that's a little different from those other, um, uh, those other uh, emergency uh, professions. So they do have the highest occupational risk of sudden cardiac death of all the professions that have been compared. We've been doing this kind of program around the country, and uh, we frequently hear primary care docs say, uh, my patient's health is a team deal. We're working together on this, it's not just me. Uh, but I think two in, two out is one of the best formulations of that rule that I've heard. I'm really grateful to you, Tom, for doing that. Now, uh, you know, the primary care doc, the family doc, uh, sounds like somebody in a 1930s movie. He's a friendly guy with a white, you know, she, she has a white coat on and a stethoscope and uh, sits in the office and chats with you. It seems low tech. But as a matter of fact, what we found is that advances in uh, primary care, which as we know, advance population health at reduced cost, are tied more and more to our technological advances in this modern wired world. And um, a couple of places in North Carolina are national models for that kind of development, bringing modern technology to bear to improve local health statistics at lower cost. And one of the places that this is happening is uh, the, uh, the big boisterous uh, metropolis of Rayford, North Carolina, <laughs> where Karen Smith is running a one-doctor operation. Can you tell us about how you've put technology to work to help your patients? Very good, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity to share our story. Um, technology was introduced in our practice by virtue of need. I entered a practice <laughs> where a physician had been uh, there for 30 years or longer. And so when we walked in, the file room was literally one third of the building and there were 18,000 charts. We were adding on generations of families, more charts. I went into the back office and there was this, this case of three by five index cards. And on those index cards would be the name of the patient the diagnosis, for example, strep throat, amoxyl, and $5. That was the medical record. <laughs> so how do, we, how do we care for a community? And they all seem to have passed through the doors of this practice. So there was a need. But I want to present two stories um, that occurred. And one is very recent and how technology, not only did it allow us to better document and keep up with information a little bit more than the index cards that you guys are writing on, but the first story was a 61-year-old gentleman, military retiree, African-American, actively working in his uh, retired field of choice, who we reviewed his military records and recognized this gentleman was due for colonoscopy. He's on schedule. VA had done a great job, kept him on schedule. And so we were able to get him set up for his colonoscopy. He had it done. And lo and behold, he was diagnosed with rectal carcinoma. Went through the military system to get care in our local area. Couldn't do that. We had to utilize the tertiary care center. And he finally was able to have his rectal carcinoma appropriately treated, and he's back to work. Same gentleman last year came in and was just talking and said, you know, I think the um, prostate um, is an issue as well. And I said, well, why is that? Well, I just buried my brother from prostate cancer. And I oh. said, oh, oh, that is an issue. <laughs> but both of these had already been identified in the EHR in our preventive HEDIS measures, the quality measures. And so, you know, we're on the same wavelength here. So by the way, he 
goes ahead, he has his PSA, 4.6. Well, that may not be anything beyond that of BPH or what we know of as benign prosthetic hypertrophy. Lo and behold, he goes to the urologist, and guess what? Prostate cancer. Again, identified utilizing the EHR. Another story. February of this past year, 51-year-old gentleman just received insurance from the ACA. I have a cold. I think I have the flu. He said, come on in. So we put him in the system, and we treat him for his cold. And I said, you know, it looks like you've been out of the system for a while, and I see that your preventive measures are coming up on the EHR. You're 51. You need a colonoscopy. This gentleman really was not there for a colonoscopy. He was there because he had a cold. I said, you're here. Let's get things set up for you. Well, while reviewing summaries about a week ago, this gentleman had sequel carcinoma and has already had his procedure done. And that came from a cold. So that's the use of technology. When the patients come in, we need to change our concept in terms of out of sight, out of mind care, meaning our face-to-face -face encounters. We're now taking care of people and we're taking care of their preventive health needs and we're doing it at the point of contact, the time of service is what some of us may say. And we're going to introduce those preventive health measures. And technology allows us to do that. There is no way I could have kept up with those needs for those two gentlemen with 23,000 paper charts, yeah. volume yeah. one through three or more, and index cards. Technology made a difference. Part of the work that we do is to identify other ways which our colleagues can utilize technology. The electronic health record should not be our foe. It should be similar to the use of our stethoscope. It is a tool to help us better care for people. And if we get really smart with it, we can also utilize it for population health. I've been in my little community for 24 years. I should know the population similar to my, my colleague. He knew the people. We go to Walmart, we go to Food Lion, we go to the same church, we know the people. But guess what? I can't remember who had their mammogram and who had the colonoscopy. But when they come into the office, I need to utilize that. I need to utilize the EHR for that. The EHR should not come between me and the person. The EHR should rapidly get that information, allowing me to have more time to connect with our patients. And that's the goal that we're going for. That's what we would like to see. And so the, we're looking also to patient satisfaction. Once I review the lab, I don't need to call them back in. I'm in a community where we have a turkey processing plant, or we did, and we're about to get another one. But they don't have time to get off of work to come learn that they have elevated cholesterol. So we utilize the patient portal. We utilize their smartphones. And we get that information. Not only the result of the laboratory, but what you should do. Did you know the Mediterranean diet is now being advocated to help decrease the risk of stroke? We can get that information to them utilizing this technology. So patients like that. They're happier with that type of communication and professional satisfaction. I'm a mom. I have four kids. I have a husband. I have a cat and a couple of kittens, I believe. And I have some dogs. So we need to take care of ourselves and take care of our family and still be part of the community. And that's what the EHR has allowed us to do. We just introduced fiber optics in our little community, my little practice on my little corner. We're the only one who has fiber optics in the entire area, but we're going to get that spread out to the rest of the community. So that's what technology should do. It should help us. It should be our friend and not our foe. So for those physicians who are still complaining about why you can't work your EHR or your computer, let it be your friend, not your foe. Thank you. Uh, Karen, I bet you've heard this a lot of uh, sometimes patients gripe that when I go see my doctor, he spends all the time typing into his computer. What do you do about that? 
That's when we get with the physician and try to introduce the concept of utilizing the EHR to help you. And a lot of this happens because the technology has changed and some doctors just simply may not know exactly what the computer can do, or you might need fiber optics that may be slowing you down, that you're on this um, different type of line for connectivity. And so that's when we really need to utilize our colleagues, go in and figure out what is the problem. And oftentimes I find out it's a workflow problem. We're really not utilizing team-based care the way we should, and therefore we've increased the amount of time. Doctors try to get everything at the one visit, yet we don't utilize technology in our best interest to capture all of that information. So that's typically what I've found to be the issue. Do you suppose family doctors all over North Carolina are using EHRs now, or are they writing notes on cards? I, <laughs> I hope no one is using three by five cards, <laughs> but, and there might be some, <laughs> there may be. Um, I believe, you know, North Carolina has really been good with the adoption of electronic health record. That was certainly my presidential project in the year 2005, I believe, yeah. and that was the uh, presidential project to introduce that. And likewise, even with patient-centered medical home, um, recognition, North Carolina has been very good in terms of our numbers. And so we, we're very well supported and we're doing this. Um, I, I think if we can continue to work with our leaders, our legislators to promote um, the cost effective care along the triple aim, I believe we will continue to stand out. We will be able to take care of the people who live in our state. Uh, and what was transformation of the dinosaur? Ah. Uh, Transformation of the Dinosaur, that was my presidential project. And so we did a series of road shows uh, where we went into several communities um, and we presented why physicians need to uh, utilize EHR. Um, the president, a couple of presidents before me actually um, introduced fax machines in the office, and I said, I will introduce computers in the office, kind of launching off of the same concept, and it was highly successful. We needed to transform our healthcare system, which was in dinosaur mode, um, to get it to where we are now, and to make sure that we have set the platform for where we need to go in the future. Can the EHR in your office talk to the hospitals and the pharmacists? That's actually one of the best things. Um, I am in a very rural area, and yes, uh, we do have um, it set up so that I can see the summaries and the labs. Um, I guess the question becomes, are we truly interoperable? Meaning, do we have the North Carolina Health Information Exchange System up and operating? Is that where we need to be going in the future? We're not quite there, but at least we've talked about it, we're doing it, got a little money for it, and we hope to see that we will all be able to see the same information about that ind individual, regardless of where they find themselves in the healthcare arena. So I, I didn't know about this North Carolina system. This is a statewide inter interoperability plan? Well, I don't, I don't want to call it interoperability as opposed to allowing us to uh, have shared information about um, patients. Um, so if the person um, was in the emergency room or they're in my office or perhaps they're in a specialist office, all of us would be able to see the uh, basic components of what, um, what's in that person's medical record. Uh, the interoperability piece is the roadmap to interoperability, which the Office of the National Coordinator is working on in terms of how do our vendor systems um, communicate without us having the, um, oh, shall I say, all of us having the same system. So that's a little bit different. Got it. Uh, I think another way that that uh, new technology could be used is to help the patient and the doctor keep track of each other when they're not in the office, between office visits. And uh, Dr. Tom Workup has been doing some work in that area. Can you tell us about it? Sure. I think uh, we, like Karen, are, are passionate about technology. We love technology at Carolina Advanced Health. Um, I think we all appreciate that more healthcare has to be pushed out beyond the four walls of the office. I think we don't know that that's coming. 
and four technologies that I'll share with you that just as a kind of a sampling of what we do. One is we use a cell phone based sugar meter. We were the first ones to launch it in North Carolina. So this platform is really the epitome of staying engaged without being intrusive. So when we <laughs> use it for our diabetics, that when they take their sugar stripped out, it gets trans the number gets transmitted to a web page. Now that web page is surveyed by our PharmD and our case manager on a pretty routine basis. And what we can do in working with this company is that it'll bubble to the top of the website who had had hyperglycemic events or high sugars or low sugar events, who's not using their meters, and just allows us to be very interactive and proactive with our patients. I'll give you a story. When we first started using it, we put it on a new patient, had very high blood sugars, insulin dependent, and fasting sugars were pretty decent. Nothing to justify this larger A1C or average blood sugar over three months. Then all of a sudden we come to lunchtime. And lunchtime we're at 386, we're 410. What is going on at lunchtime? So what we do is, uh, at what we had done at that point is get our, our uh, nutritionist. Our nutritionist had reached out to the patient and said, let's do a quick dietary recall over the last two days. And what he didn't realize is what he was eating had such a high uh, glycemic index. So the beauty of that for me is we engaged the patient at the right time, had a teachable moment at that moment. For any physician in this room that's treated diabetes, we often get a diabetic who comes in with their sugars are being elevated, and then you have a root, you have a generic conversation about what their diet is, and you can't quite figure out why their sugar levels are higher than they would be, and everything is just a pretty generic conversation. So we were able to drill down right then and there what that particular patient was doing. We can send texts back to these meters, and also we're, it's, it's been pretty phenomenal. And also that PharmD and nutritionists run that site for the most part, another aspect of a team-based approach much like what we talked about earlier, yeah. I had no hand in that entire event. You know, they would notify me of the event, but they understand that the team's mission is to titrate and modify and identify trouble spots for these individuals. So that was a great way to stay contacted. Another one is we're using a mobile, um, a mobile platform to do virtual visits. We do about 15% of all of our visits electronically now. And we can do it based on their iPad or their Android phone or their I Apple iPhone. So the not, that gives us the ability to stay engaged wherever they are. Could be in North Carolina, could be in the world. I had an e-visit with a patient that was in London. And so the, the beauty of that is that you get to have a conversation with your provider at a time when they need it, and you can help guide them along the way. You're doing that, this on Skype? It's a, uh, no, it's a secured platform which is HIPAA compliant, but it's a, similar to a Skype but more for the medical community. Okay. And there are many of these type of platforms out there, but. They're, they're a version of Skype, but in a secured platform. Got it. Okay. Uh, we do teledermatology. We're the only office that, that actually Tele with UNC uh -huh. Dermatology at Southern Village, we have a, a Cisco camera that uh, is set up in our office where we're the only ones that do adult dermatological telehealth visits. And I can tell you it's been phenomenal. When you talk about patient-centered, if somebody's in my office, and, and primary care docs tend to be very good at rash, lesions, biopsies, et cetera, but if there's something that's perplexing to us, I can just take them to the next room, enter them into the dermatology schedule, attend them as if they were in their office, and on average 10 to 15 minutes, the dermatologist is on the screen, talking with the patient, zooming in the camera, having a real conversation with that patient, and helping us guide what we would like to do next. The dual benefit there is the patient gets what they need when they need it, without delay, but then also makes us better. I think we understand how the dermatologist thinks, and then we can better apply it to that next patient. And I think at first, there might have been some suspicion or a threat that these things would, would uh, maybe make certain things obsolete, but it's quite the opposite. I think that we can bring UNC Chapel Hill or any other healthcare industry to anywhere in the, con anywhere in the country, certainly rural parts of the state, and allow us to connect each other a little bit better. Something we just started this week, which I, I don't have really a verdict of, of what it's gonna help me do long term yet, but we created, we have touch screens now in our rooms to where what we had done for our patients with diabetes is that we did our own YouTube videos. We always felt that the patient probably wanted to hear my inflection or the other doc's inflections uh. about how we feel about what does it mean to be a diabetic or an asthmatic or somebody with depression. So we had recorded our own YouTube videos and now we've placed them on this touch screen. So we can put those things there, we can put things that are diet educationals or whatever we'd like to by just touching it. And so if that patient's waiting for us, they can watch it. But try to make that entire event for them an educational moment. They can get education. Uh, we're working on pushing it directly to their portal. Most of the large EHRs now have portals. 
and we can push it right, for them, right to their portal at home that they can review at any time they want. And they have access to all those educationals now on our website. You mean so, when they're in the waiting room, instead of reading National Geographic, they can look at a video? We have an interesting kind of office concept where we actually call it a landing area. So <laughs> our, our, our waiting room is extremely small because we don't want people to wait. We'd rather kind of have them back into the room right away, mm -hmm. and that way uh, they, all their visit can begin and end right there. So when they're done, they actually just walk right out of the building. And you don't stop at the front desk and give them the same forms you did three times in the last four weeks and all that type of stuff that happens in some traditional environments. Um, but all of these tools have allowed us to really achieve some pretty significant quality metrics. I had mentioned those 22 metrics. We are at or exceed the 90th percentile for NCQA on almost all of them when there actually is an NCQA marker. And we've actually uh, jumped into the bundling of this year where Geisinger and other major institutions bundle now to say, highly um, efficient practices like this, how many of your diabetics have all of these things? And in Geisinger, Geisinger's experience, it was a little bit um, uh, interesting for doctors to assume they did a really good job, but they may only have five out, of the, five out of the six or seven out of the eight or whatever it is the metrics they were using at the time. But to have everybody there at one time, there are studies that su suggest significant micro and macro vascular uh, reductions in one year. And uh, so we're trying to achieve that. And so we've got some early studies that using all this technology as well as that EHR platform to, to getting trends close to 20% reductions in hospitalizations, 60% reductions in ER visits, and 100% reductions in urgent care visits. And, and this is the type of patient-centeredness through technology that I think we should embrace um, in, in medicine, medical practices. Yeah, that's so Geisinger is kind of the Mayo Clinic of Eastern Pennsylvania. Tens of thousands, probably 100,000 patients. And how many patients in your practice? Right now, we started from zero. We have 2,700 chronically ill people. Wow. And you're doing all the same technology. That's... Does somebody pay you when you televisit the patient in London? Uh, they, there's a claim that we can drop and is paid for by their, their uh, health insurers. Uh. What we're pushing for for the future is, is trying to push the theme of physician to physician reimbursement. Right now, there is no reimbursement stream that if I want to talk to uh, a, a specialist in a different area oh. of the country about a patient that I need, especially if you're in a rural community, there's no reimbursement mechanism for that right now. I think that'll be the next uh, step for us. And what do you do? You just kind of call on their good nature to get them to help you then? or A lot of times you find a lot of, a lot of specialists that have a real appetite for this. They, they want to be collegial, and they, they want to do it. Um, their environment sometimes makes it difficult for them to, to always be able to participate, but we found plenty of pockets throughout our, our uh, system that would like to do it. Uh, could I ask you again about the small waiting room? I don't, I don't like the waiting room in my doctor's office. I'm there more than half of the whole visit, I feel, and uh, how, how does yours work? So our, our waiting room is, is, is interesting. We, uh, we don't want to give anybody any indirect messages that you're going to be hanging out here for a while. Yeah. So there's no, there's no TV. There are, there, I think there are a few magazines, but that's it. Uh, the, uh, our goal is that to be respectful to our patients is to try to whisk them back within about five minutes of them being there. So we, have, um, we spend a lot of time in our process and our proce procedures to make that happen. But uh, and the team-based approach also is grabbing other members of our healthcare team to help out. So we have medical assistants. That's our primary support role within the office. So we have one float medical assistant, so if my primary MA is caught up, they're available to go grab that patient. So that way you don't walk into a room, and, it, and the opposite tends to happen for us where sometimes you might go into a physician's office and there's nine people there and you're like, oh my goodness, how long am I going to be here? Yeah. But the people will say, there's no one ever here. Like how many, <laughs> you know, are you guys open or I mean, how many people? <laughs> so it's kind of a, we're having to retrain patients too on what they should expect out of our, their offices. Ah, uh, that's terrific. As I say, I, I, when I go to the doctor, you spend a lot of time in the waiting room, and there are a bunch of other people, and you wonder how sick they are. And, uh, and after a while, you know, a receptionist comes out with a chart, and I think under HIPAA, they can't say your last name. So she says, uh, Tom, is there a Tom, Tom, any Tom here? Yeah, I think that's me. Uh, and uh, I used to live in Japan, and 
uh, went to the doctor in Japan, and the waiting room looks identical, you know. It's, it's just a waiting room. There's a receptionist and National Geographic and stuff. And, uh, but the receptionist comes out with her chart, and she says, <clears throat> Tomaso Rito-sama, irashimasu ka? Tomaso Rito-sama, irashimasu ka? And that means, has the highly honorable Thomas Reed graced us with his presence today? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you feel better before you even see the doctor. You know? <laughs> I've been trying to get that introduced in Denver, but it, it, they're not. Uh... So um, what we've heard today, I, I just, as I said earlier, kind of people who pay attention to health policy nationally are looking at North Carolina because, <laughs> because we have seen the kind of things going on in this state that are really putting North Carolina, and particularly primary care in North Carolina, really at the cutting edge, at the front edge of improvements in American medicine overall. And so here's the question. Can we, can we take it out of Granite Falls? Can we take it out of Cherville and, and extend this? Um, what do you think we ought to do um, to see the kind of innovation we're seeing in North Carolina uh, expanded, well, to the rest of North Carolina, but to, to the whole country. And I, I think I'll just ask everybody, I'll start with Ed, if you don't mind, what do you think? How could we take the lessons of Granite Falls and let the rest of the country learn from them? Well, I think one thing, to really be successful in this patient-centered medical home model, um, I kind of look at this as a triangle, and the top of the triangle is the medical knowledge. Um, at the basis of the triangle are uh, business management skills and then IT skills. And you find a lot, I mean, we all, we all have the medical knowledge, we feel very comfortable with that. We're very uncomfortable with the business management and the IT portion of this. And um, I was talking to an engineering friend of mine not too long ago and I was frustrated that more physicians weren't getting this whole concept. And he said, well, it's, it's because uh, the last two things you described are completely out of their comfort range. And so one of the things I think we need to do is help physicians that are trying to move in this direction with the business management and the IT part of this whole model. And uh, particularly for smaller practices, you know, in North Carolina, I think 50 or 60% of all primary care physicians are in one to four physician practices. Really? Oh. Yeah. And, um, and they need help, you know, with, with a lot of the stuff that we've talked about. And, you know, we've, we've talked about forming a clinical integration network, which is a larger organization that can maybe bring to, you know, help to these practices, um, maybe getting involved with an ACO that has a lot more uh, resources. Uh, and I, th I think that would be uh, one thing to look at. Um, secondly, we've got this model that uh, a lot of physicians really aren't aware of in, in the state, but certainly I think we have more notoriety outside of the state, but we've got this model CCMC, which has basically defined what the medical home is. And uh, they have all the infrastructure in place, the PharmDs, the mental health, the patient care managers. And if, if we could, convince the rest of the payers um, to take all those disparate parts and uh, hook them up with all these physicians in all these counties. Yes. Um, and you could do that, you know, you could have each of those pieces assigned to five practices in an area. And each day they went to a different practice. And the model's already here. It wouldn't be that hard to, um, 
to set it up, you know, if you could just have get tried everybody to, to buy. Have you gone to insurers and said we could do this for you? I haven't, but um, have, have I'm sure other people in this room that are involved with that uh, have, would, we certainly talk about it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I guess a couple other things that I'll just throw out there. You know, I think every patient ought to have a primary care provider and everybody ought to have health insurance. You know, I think that ought to be a goal. I think everybody in this room feels that's a goal for not only North Carolina, but the state, uh, or, but the country in general. Um, so I'll stop there. Yeah, that's a, that's a good place to stop. It, it, a decent ethical wealthy democracy ought to provide health care for everybody. That seems pretty basic to me, and all the other ones do. I was told to stay non-political, so I'm going to stop right there. Uh, Mary, you're doing already doing three-state kind of coordination. Uh, can we expand this? Uh, so um, let me just say, lots of people are doing three-state coordination, but yeah. let, let me um, say, um, talk about expanding just the right kind of experience to our students and residents. That's, that's, I'm representing academics here on the podium. And I'm just blown away by the work I've heard about on the panel today and, and what these folks are doing. And it's, they're, they're great examples of care. Um, but I don't know about you guys, but I'm getting older. And we ha we've got to get the folks coming behind us. So I want to say a couple of things. One is um, our medical students now we, in Charlotte, we have you know, about 50 students at any one time. 25 of them are our Charlotte uh, third and fourth year medical students. And a, and a significant portion of them next year, all of them, and it's spreading to UNC, the School of Medicine in Chapel Hill, spend their third year actually with the same doctors all year. So they learn internal medicine by being with an internal medicine doctor in their office in the community. They learn family medicine by being with the same family physician in their office a half day a week for the whole year. So we're trying to teach all of these medical students, and for those who don't know, only uh, about 17% and, and, and decreasing every year um, of medical students go into primary care. And by that, that definition is a little confusing because some of those are hospitalists, which I might consider general medicine, but not primary care. So. Our, our primary care workforce is significantly decreasing, and we need to show them, this stuff is exciting, right? We need to show them um, all of these models of care that, that can be exciting for them. Also, um, you know, when we talk about technology and getting these, you know, old girls and guys to, you know, learn technology, well, you know, we, we need to bring the, um, what's it called again, the generation that only knows, uh, the natives, you know, the, the um, tech, what? No, yes, but the people who have, you know, came out of the womb um, punching on their iPhones. Um, <laughs> they, yeah, this, that stuff, we need them in there. So, um, so that's one thing, the medical students. And then um, residents, I wanted to tell one story. Um, again, all of us can go on and on, I think. But there's, so in Anson County, um, ranked number um, 87 out of 100 counties in North Carolina, they had a little community hospital that was closing. And so we've created a health center there, and I'm not here to tell, I'm not gonna tell that story, um, because that's like a lot of the work that's been done up here, a real fabulous, amazing sort of health center, patient-centered medical home with an ED, so patients who come in from the community um, get to the right place at the right time. But we need, I remember I was at one of the planning meetings for that years ago, and they said, um, Mary, do you think it'll be hard to get a doctor to go out there and I was like, what, are you kidding me? I mean, yeah, it's going to be hard to get a doctor to go out there. But um, what we're doing in residency is um, we have one practice called um, Biddle Point Family Medicine that was established. It's urban, but in an underserved area. Physician here, Jessica Sachs, has, uh, has been there the whole time it's been there. Um, and um, she, this physician learned to practice in a, in a We've been trying to patient center medical home for a long time, but to the point to serve the underserved and to do care in a different way within the community. And she went back home to DC after she finished her residency at Biddle Point. But when she heard about Anson County and this health center and the way they were so completely involved in the community, she came back. She said, oh my gosh, that's my dream job. And back she came. Um, and that was the kind of care she was used to providing. She'd learned it at, at, at Biddle Point. Um, and then uh, Cabarrus Family Medicine, you know, they were way ahead of their time 
um, almost 20 years ago, right? 20 years ago when they, when they put residents in real practices. So we used to put um, practices on top of residents to, for them to learn. Now they put residents in practices. So thriving, busy family practices that saw all kinds of patients in the communities. And they put the residents, so there's more real, real doctors and, uh, and less residents within each of the practices. And one of those doctors is going to Anson County. So it's giving residents experience in these fabulous places and then, and then making sure they go on and, and, and spread it throughout the country. So that's one example. Yeah, excellent. So Kathy, uh, the kind of work you're doing for self-insuring companies in Hickory there are millions of companies like that in the United States. Wouldn't they like to get the same benefits? Um, I, I don't understand why they wouldn't like to. And I, I certainly think that, that the opportunity exists um, to take the models of care that we have um, deployed and spread them at a, at a larger scale. I think that what's necessary to make that happen is you've got to have the providers of care um, at a local level, sitting down with the people that are financing that care at that local level, regardless of who they are, and having real open, um, dynamic conversations. And that has to include full transparency. The data um, has to be there and it has to be exchanged. And I think that goes without saying that it has to be understood that there's going to be an investment in the technology because we have to get the systems to talk to one another. The, the business leaders that I work for just cannot understand why they can leave here and take money out of an ATM and show up in China and they know exactly how much money's left in the bank and they can get the ATM, but they can't get medical records to talk to one another and EMRs to talk to one another. It just drives them nuts. I mean, some, one of them just came back last week and said he was at Disney with his grandchildren. He said, do you realize now you can put a wristband on your grandchild, you can wear one, and they know where the kid is all the time. Yeah. But we can't know that somebody just saw two different <laughs> physicians across the street yeah. and what happened from one another. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the, t the fact that the technology's out there, we've just got to embrace it and accept that that's a given, that that's going to be the future, and then you've got to get the right party sitting at the table to, to make it happen, because I don't believe there's one model of care. I think that patient-centered medical home is an approach to care. I don't think any of us would disagree with the core um, principles of patient-centered care, but I don't think it's one size fits all. I think you have to know your patient and your, your industry knows their population, and you have to marry those two characteristics to figure out what works. Well, do you think when your client, at, is it Vanguard, is the furniture company? Mm -hmm. When he goes to the National Furniture Makers Convention, do you suppose he's bragging about what he's got in healthcare? Um, he, he does. I mean, he tells, he has people come to him all the time as a leader and say, what have you done? Yeah. And I will tell you that um, his discussion is changing a little bit right now because he's now competing again for workforce. I mean, we had a yeah. period of several years when um, you could hire anybody out there to come to work. Well, now um, it's real hard for them to find people to come in to do the job. So health benefits and the package you offer becomes um, really part of your power to attract new employees. What we love to hear and we find interesting is that somebody goes from one of our companies to another company and they say to the human resource person, the only, I really like working over there where I am now. I really just want to leave because they make me see the doctor. They make me go do these things. <laughs> and they look at them and say, we have the same plan here. Uh, so that, that's when we think it's a real win at a yeah. community level. And that's yeah. why, again, a lot of this is grassroots so that we can roll it up to a, to a higher scale. Uh, Karen Smith, do you think um, other communities in America the size of Rayford could get the kind of uh, technological uh, connections that you have? Absolutely. And one of the things, it was interesting that you asked about transformation of a dinosaur because that was created out of our need of understanding what the physicians needed throughout the state. And we, we actually became the Oprah Winfrey of medicine. <laughs> and we listened to all the stories that my colleagues from the, the mountains of North Carolina, the coastal, the southern, down east, all of their stories, and we put them together, and boy, they were some stories. So I really felt like Oprah whimpering. But what we were looking at was what we could do to help physicians change their way of practice to get increased satisfaction in practice 
What are we trying to do? We want to create happy doctors so that when patients go see their doctors, they'll have a happy doctor, and the doctor will make their patients happy, and we might just have improved outcome. So I think it's imperative that we utilize the technology tools to increase the efficiency in the way we practice so that we'll have happy doctors and good outcomes for our patients. So long answer to the short question, yes, I think we can do this. We need our societies, the AFP, NCAFP, Medical Society, to all be on board with we want to make happy doctors so we can have happy patients. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I want to ask both Dr. Hall and Dr. Smith this question. Why don't all the EHR systems in the United States talk to each other? <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to say. We uh, should save that for the question and answer. I, I did some study in, uh, of health care in France. Every single person in France over the age of six is given a card. It's a green card, card the carte vitale. 61 million Frenchmen have it. And it has your whole health care record on a gold chip. It's encrypted. And any pharmacist, any chiropractor, any doctor can read it. They all talk to each other. And I, in my view, that's because the government in France set a standard and imposed it. And uh, that's why I'm asking you, how are we going to get to that stage in the United States? Well, I'll, I'll go first. Yeah. Good, go ahead. I'll go first. Um, we, we actually are looking at that in our country in terms of having a unique um, patient identifier number, um, so-called UPN, UPN that we know of as physicians. But um, we are looking at that. Um, it, it's, it's an old concept, actually. Um, but how do you centralize this, just as France um, has boastfully um, been able to accomplish, how do we do that in this country? And that's actually one of the solutions that's listed on the roadmap to interoperability. Um, so yes, we are certainly uh, looking at that. Um, we're also looking at putting a chip um, in the, the folds of the neck. Um, so if you're a diabetic, uh, we'll have all of your information by merely scanning that chip. Um, I don't think too many of our patients will go for that. Yeah, and so little, we had uh, to look at other ways. Yeah. But to, to look at a unique patient identifier number is a concept that is being analyzed. Yeah, that's, uh, that's getting a little edgy there, I think. Uh, <laughs> I, I do think uh, electronic medical records, as, as we've learned in, in, uh, from these doctors, really can improve health care. They can make health care more efficient. They can do a better job. And uh, uh, this is an area, strikingly, even though we're the technological leader of the world, where other countries have done a better job in the United States in getting everybody on EHRs. Everybody in Taiwan is on EHR. Uh, Britain is going to get everybody on in two years. Even Mexico is going to have a EHR for everybody, and they're all interoperable. And meanwhile, the U.S. has, what, 240 different proprietary systems that don't talk to each other. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. It kind of ticks me off. Interestingly, um, they, they tried to do it in Germany. In, in France, it's called the carte vitale, the card, the vital card, the card of life. In uh, Taiwan, it's called the e-card. And in Germany, it's called the Gesundheitskarte, the health card. And the Germans resisted it. They don't want government having that kind of data about them because of their history. It's pretty interesting. So uh, it, it's a little touchy. But. Um, Kim, we, we heard the really dramatic story about your patient, Sylvia, and her management team. Uh, is this spreading around the country? Uh, are other places doing this? Well, here with CCNC, we do have over 10 years of data looking at what we've done or what has been done for more than 10 years. And we've talked about the triple aim of better care for the individual. We have better care for Miss Sylvia. We talk about better care health outcomes, and we do have that information that says this coordinated care effort has provided better care for our population. 
And then we also have some really important data that shows that North Carolina is leading the country in declining growth spending rates yes. for our Medicaid population. There are still states with double digit um, spending rates and ours is down to about three to four percent. And so yes, actually we have states that are coming to us to say help us with, with implementing a coordinated care system in our state. We have, um, Arkansas has already um, partnered with us and um, we have a, a couple of other states that have come to us to say, help us. Good, good. Uh, I think, uh, perhaps you know this, but uh, anybody who visits CMS, which is the Center for Medicare and uh, Medicaid Services in Washington, D.C., they love community care of North Carolina because of what that this group of primary doctors has done to provide care at really lower cost than most other states. They love it and I think they would love to export it to other states. They're trying to figure out how to do it, and, uh, but I think they'd like that. Uh, Tom, how about your, uh, your work on uh, monitoring uh, chronic illness? Is that going on elsewhere? Can we teach the rest of the country how to do this? It, it is definitely going on elsewhere, and, and I think I, I'd echo uh, Ed's point earlier that clinically integrated networks is probably where this is best utilized. Can you start to put a centralized location of team members, PharmDs, case managers, and look at a larger population of patients, whether it be from a health insurer or from a network like UNC or others, to say, let me look at all of our high-risk diabetics and look at them from a central location and then allow maybe under-resourced practices to utilize services through that central hub. So I would say we are doing it on our scale, but it's being thought of on a much larger scale. Yeah people coming to you to see how you do this, or is that happening? We have frequent visitors that try to get an understanding both on how we would apply it, but then how we feel doing it for the last three and a half years, how we would apply it on a larger scale. Yeah, that's great. And um, Dr. White, what do you think uh, are the kind of population, the, the two in, two out, the teamwork approach that has worked so well in, in uh, Cherryville is can we, could we teach the rest of the country how to do that? Um, well, I think first what I want to say is thank you and thank the American Academy, um, Ann and Kirsten, for doing this campaign across the country, uh, for doing health as primary. Because I think the stories that will be told across the country uh, are hugely important. And I think they will go a long way to beginning to change uh, the perception of primary care, valuing primary care. Um, and I think that's really important. I just, I want to thank all of you involved for making this happen and bringing it to North Carolina and then across the country. So thank you. I, I, I guess what I want people to remember about my story is that it is about the firefighters but it's not completely about the firefighters. It's about a preventable disease and how do we approach a preventable disease. It's, it's not easy and there are a lot of barriers. Some of those barriers are simply attitudinal and what we value, uh, what society values. Um, I, I'm gonna be a little provocative and paraphrase an old Chinese saying from probably a couple of thousand years ago and that is, that superior care prevents the disease, mediocre care um, takes care of the disease when it becomes evident, and inferior care takes care of in-stage disease. Yeah. And I think if we can begin to change attitudes and value prevention and reward it, then we will accomplish much. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Well, in my view, one way that we could export, scale up what we've seen in North Carolina is for more people to hear from doctors like this and hear their stories of how in these communities they're um, advancing healthcare. 
Uh, anyway, it's enough questions for me. I think we're done with that. But we need, we'd like to hear some questions from you. What would you like to know? And I'm going to ask our board chairman, Dr. Stream, to take over that part. Thanks, thanks, Tom. And your, your teaser about we should go and hear more of these stores is great, because I think you and I are going to Chicago uh, <laughs> next month to do this again. Uh, so we were going to have uh, T.R. Reed as part of the panel, just so he could participate, because some of your questions may be for him, uh, and certainly can be for any of our panelists. I, I had a couple questions uh, passed forward already. If other people have uh, some, if you could pass them forward, happy to take your questions. Great, thanks. Um, but anyway, uh, anybody first, a live person out there on a microphone that would like to ask a question. Ma'am, with the, with the microphone. Microphone. Um, is that on? Okay. Uh, it's wonderful to hear everyone's stories about these great value-added practices out there. It's refreshing to hear everyone's energy. My question today follows up on what Dr. White said about value, is how do we change the volume-based fee-for-service model that we find ourselves in to a truly value-based payment system where we can all strive and succeed? Because the fee-for-service volume-based payment system really puts family practice at a disadvantage. Any of our panelists? Sure. One of the models that we're trying to do is, is to make that leap to fee for value. And, and you're right, it's extremely difficult. And I can say three and a half years later that I'm not so sure that we're significantly closer to a new answer than we were three and a half years ago because right now we live in two worlds. We have hospital based systems that currently still run on a fee for service and are well rewarded for a fee for service model, but a lot of the community based practices are trying to jump into a fee for value system. So I, I think my answer to that is we have to drive that conversation. And I think the health insurers will be open to those conversations if we could prove some things that we could do consistently. I think if we could show that we could achieve quality metrics, we can actually achieve population management, and not necessarily on singular stories here, but on systems levels to where we can go into risk-based contracting the only way we can do that successfully is to know that we can all link to each other and that we can take care of care gaps at multiple levels of the system. Just because you're going to go see the cardiologist doesn't mean they can't give you a pneumococcal pneumonia shot. Right now, that's like, you know, don't, don't bother me with that. I'm not asking them to do your, your pap smear. I'm asking them to give you your pneumococcal shot. So I think until we can get our, our specialist brethren to understand that, that they are our patients, not just my patient or your patient or others, for say UNC, it's their UNC's patient. And how do we best hit them each and every single point of contact to maximize care gap closure? I think then we could go with confidence to payers and say, here are the quality metrics that we wish to be paid on. And we, maybe we forego whatever particular percentage gain that we're trying to achieve in a fee-for-service market and say, hold back some of that. I'd rather it being compensated in a different bucket. But you have to be able to prove it at our end to, to, to make that step. Yeah, I think that's a good question. And we, we struggle with that a little bit too, especially with the statin idea where we're treating to a target, then some guidelines from November 13 said maybe not, and it looks like we're rapidly going back to treat to a target. And so I think what we're trying to, sh to deal with at a UNC Physicians Network level, which are the community-based practices, is to say, can we at least agree to agree that there are reasonable metrics? So if you want to make blood pressure 140 over 90, but you personally want to make it 135 over 85, great. You're going to meet that metric. And, but then how do you deal? But then the first hand shoots up and says, well, what are you going to do about the Medicare population that says that they should be at 150? So these are kind of the difficulties that we do run into where I think we need to have sober conversations with our brethren and say, here are some quality metrics that we're going to at least agree to for a year, two years, three years. And then exclude the ones that are more controversial. The ones that we've excluded from our metric from a contract basis is 
pap smear guidelines. Who's on three years, who's on five years? Believe it or not, with all of what Epic is, it can't ferret out the person that's got a three or a five year. That still has to be us. And so that's a little too difficult on a grand scheme. Uh, and also diabetes. We actually do do diabetes less than 100, even though we also track diabetes on a statin. Because we have to realize that the partner we're asking to pay for it have to adhere to NCQA guidelines, typically, because of their because their accreditation. So I think we have to be understanding of their stressors. They need to understand our stressors and say, where can we meet in the middle? It's not going to be a perfect process. But I do think it's a step in building that relationship and that trust. So I'm overwhelmed by the tsunami of written questions. So I'm going to start with some that came in early on. And we'll see if any of our panelists can impress us by having already read today's New York Times. Um, so apparently there's an article in today's New York Time, uh, Times titled, The Tangle of Coordinated Health Care. And it highlights uh, the importance of care coordination and sort of the industry that's grown around care coordination. Uh, and so how do we do care coordination without creating a, says a mess out of those efforts. That's not my words, that's on the question. Um, and says, who coordinates the coordinators? So, any of our panelists care to take a swipe at that one? Swipe? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's baseball season. <laughs> Um, I will attempt. Um, I don't know if I can answer who coordinates the coordinators, but um, what was the first question? <laughs> so how, you know, how, do you, how do you keep it from creating more of a mess? Well, one of the things that we've done is, is again, we've, there are standardized plans that have been put in place. Um, we know what the patient-centered medical home criteria are. We know what the NCQA criteria are, and, and we keep to those. And so we try to avoid some, well, there are still some moving targets, but um, yeah, we, we've all tried to, to um, all the networks and, and within CCNC, we have this, this standardized plan that we're, we're not, you know, um, just roaming around that we're, we're sticking to that. I wish I could say I, I had read the article because maybe I could respond yeah, a little more specific. It was actually, I think, yesterday. Is there time? Oh. The, the problem is, is that when, when the insurers have care coordinators, yeah, that's where I was going. Offices, yeah. and, that, and that's basically what they were saying. So, but they also so remember the grapefruit diet, which was you ate a grapefruit and everybody said you lose weight. So what's the American way? Make a grapefruit pill, right? Because that's, that's the American way. You make a pill. So people have carved out this idea of care coordination when really it doesn't work absent the whole fruit. And the whole fruit is the medical home model with the care coordination integrated into the delivery of care. For the physicians here, you've had your patient get a call from some nurse that they don't know from city out of town from the health plan saying, you need to do this about your blood sugar. And they're like, I'm sorry, excuse you? And how did you get my phone number? Um, it goes back to Tom's question about that trust relationship, and I'm going to close with some comments about that. But if you don't know them, and if they don't know you, the effectiveness of care coordination is severely compromised, perhaps to the point of, I forget who made the point earlier, about actually being intrusive. Um, and so you know, we really need to look to it to be part of a system, not freestanding, would be my response. Can I add something? To Please, that? Ed. Um, one of the things that we found out in my practice was that if a farm D was in the practice and they were branded under my name, you know, and this goes, you know, who do you want to run all this? You want your primary care medical home to run this. Yes. And so if the farm D calls a patient and they know that they work for me or that they're affiliated with me, it's no big deal. I had a very difficult time trying to get uh, patients to um, engage in mental health when, when we, and everybody in this room knows patients that you know they need mental health, but would, would they go to a psychiatrist in another office? No way. Um, but would they come to our patient-centered medical home where a psychiatrist or a psychologist works for us and it's just, it feels right? Yeah, they'll do that. So um, basically, I think, you know, we've figured out how to do this. Why don't you let us do it, you yeah. know? Um, and everybody's so afraid to let go of that control, but 
we have we have figured out how to do it. We're, you, they're just not letting us do it. So to sort of tag on to that, and maybe any of our other panelists, because you're you're a perfect segue to the next question, which is how do we increase the availability of mental and behavioral health um, in a timely manner uh, that's cost effective and and reduce the stigma uh, associated with mental health diagnoses? Yeah. I can start. Yeah. That's, so yeah, there's please. a. Obviously, not obviously, uh, I imagine most of you know there's a great shortage of psychiatrists in the country, but also that most of our patients or most people, not, not just our patients, people don't need psychiatrists. I mean, some people need psychiatrists, but we need all types of health, of mental health professionals. So one way that we're doing that, and I, and I think it was alluded to down there as well, is um, uh, e the e-visits, doing it online, doing it by video. And so we started that a couple years ago, and I said, Patients who are mentally ill don't want to talk to a man in a box, you know, I thought. But um, in fact, it's been, it's extraordinarily well, well received. So in our emergency, it started in our emergency departments that patients would be able to speak to a, a mental health professional or a psychiatrist on, um, online. But it's now spread to, it's now integrated throughout our primary care offices and we need to do even, even more of it. And then that tends to be the psychiatry um, aspect, but the psychiatrist can work hand in hand with the primary care doctor. So primary care doctors learn and increase their own skills in behavioral health and can spread that throughout their practices and then know when to call the psychiatrist when they need help there or with another um, healthcare professional. So a lot of that is going online because it, it has to be done a different way. There's simply not enough um, professionals. That and the stigma that you referred to. I mean, I just, we all remember our, I just recently spent months trying to get a patient, one patient, who desperately, a patient I've known forever, and I, you know how, anyway, how sad that is for, if you've taken care of somebody for 25 years and have them need psychiatric help, but even though she knew me for 25 years, it took me months to get her to a psychiatrist or to even talk to somebody. So we really need it in the point of care in the primary care doctor's office. I'll make two more points on that because we're just we're just getting ready to integrate behavioral health at our work site clinics with our, our medical home plans. And two of the challenges that we heard through that process, one was um, that they needed to be on site because they didn't feel like the employees would leave and go to because the stigma attached, they would not walk into a psychiatric office. Um, the other thing was we had to address the plan benefits. You know, a lot of times in the benefits, there's still a deductible, there's still a lower coinsurance. Um, it's the same thing with diabetic education, nutrition. You've got to remove those barriers, those financial barriers for that patient. And um, then the third point is some of our primary care physicians said, but they probably don't refer to behavioral health as much as they should because they never know what happens there. So we have got to get those channels of communication open between that primary care physician and that behavioral health provider. Oh, sorry, in the audience, yeah. Somewhat related to what you were just discussing about the behavioral health barriers, on the other side of that coin, when they're in behavioral health and the comorbidities are not being addressed and there's not, you know, I have been an advocate for my whole professional career. You know, health care, medical care must address the whole person, the mental health. But what I'm finding quite often now is that on the other side of that coin, that mental health is dealing with the mental issues, but they're not addressing the comorbidities that go along with, and of course the incidence is extremely high. So I'm wondering if there's been any discussion there. And let me tag one other little sub-question to that real quickly, is how are we trying to interface what we're doing here in the primary care realm with the population health, public health uh, infrastructure that really can bring a lot to the table for many of these preventive services that physicians are needing to link to. I can uh, give you at least our experience. We, we feel exactly the same way you do. There's no way that you can't have non-bidirectional communication with mental health. I'll share a story with you. One of our worst diabetics when we first started, very, very high numbers, and his PHQ score, which is a depression screen, anything over 15 is moderate to severe, he was 22. So what we said, there is no way that we're going to control your diabetes until we take care of this. So the visit morphed 
into let's now deal with this first. And having a team-based approach, so we're fortunate to have the, an integrated behavioral health therapist with a liaison psychiatrist who we have access to. But they worked on that aspect, and then we kind of circled back together. But I would share that you could do that in an asynchronous way. You could do that on a remote format. You can do that from a central location. That, that's really pretty wonderful. Uh, so I agree. You, you must, must. I think uh, David Rubinow is, uh, 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 I believe, psychiatric chair or, or of one of the UNC departments. And he'll quote statistics like tenfold increase in cost if somebody's got a concurrent depression diagnosis. And, and we actually see that. So we would advocate for what you're describing. I think there's a couple barriers. When I was at the Indian Health Service, interestingly enough, we had a psychologist at the other end of the building. And something for you to probably to consider, uh, Kathy, is that when patients went in that side of the building, everybody else knew they were going in to see the shrink. They weren't going in. So then we had them all come through the same way. And then everybody kept peeking in the room to see who was in the room. So that, I think it's more the stigma. The idea that, that you can have diabetes and take diabetes medications, you can have behavioral health issues and need behavioral health medication or therapy. Uh, so I think it's a culture issue that we're dealing with. And we're dealing with some legacies of you have to have the mental health records over here. And we need to have the mental, the, the, behave, the regular men, uh, medical health record over here. So we have a little problem in our house too that we need to be more open to integrating and break through some of these barriers that still exist. But I would agree, you need to have both. Yeah, Karen. I wanted to also mention, we, we utilize the uh, Cisco system as well, um, not only for uh, the adult um, behavior health, um, but also for the adolescent or children um, for some of their diagnoses. But then there's a third one. We have SBIRT um, in our office. And so to have co-location and have in the EHR um, to utilize our screening tools to identify those individuals who may have these problems where perhaps they did not discuss it on intake but the screening tools, that makes a difference. Um, as well. So uh, certainly uh, those three uh, avenues uh, help out. In regard to the public health, um, we have an amazing reservoir of services in our public health with our CDEs, we have our health educators. It is an amazing reservoir that we are not utilizing. Uh, we have not learned how to collaborate, how do you do a referral, um, where the person doesn't become a patient of the uh, health department or the public health entity, but they utilize those services. The data that we, are, are, um, that we have in our public health um, can tell us, um, even with our disease surveillance uh, that can come through the uh, electronic health record, to utilize that information, know what disorders are affecting our region at that very minute, not on the news. Um, so there's a lot of different ways and opportunities to collaborate with public health. And I'll add, yeah. can I add Actually, one more? Yeah, sure, go ahead, please. One more example is just, and this is, um, that we took our um, psychiatric hospital and, and created a primary care office within it. So in the same way that patients felt comfortable going there, so the yeah. patients who were very ill um, or were hospitalized there for a period of time or long-term care, they had a continuity doctor within. So we created just a fellowship where our family doctors learned more about psychiatry and the impact of all the medications and illness on those diseases and could take care of them in a place where they felt safe. Can I add one? Please, Ed. Um, you know, we live in a country that uh, almost in some instances, and this is true, goes right through down to the payers, doesn't believe that mental health is an illness. And um, somehow we need to change that whole concept um, because mental health issues kill people just like heart disease kills people. And uh, I've run into some frustrations um, like with payers um, Blue Cross, for example, in this state, um, I don't know what the copay is now, 20 or $25, but if, if that patient sees our psychologist, they have to pay a specialty copay. And they, they have to pay it not just once, but every time they see him. So what happens is the patient sees the psychologist once, and then they say, you know, I'd love to come back, but I can't afford it. Well, you know, that whole system of payment has to change. Um, and, and insurance companies are really struggling 
how to move from this fee for service to this value based care. They don't know how to do it. You know, and we're going to have to teach them because um, they're, they're really struggling how to do that. Yeah. A couple things about the, the comments we got from mental health to public health, and certainly even dental health. It's unique in the United States that we have some a different dental than medical and mental health system, and, and there's such an interplay between those two. And, but to the point Karen was talking about, about public health, that really is a key integration with, with primary care and another area where North Carolina has been uh, uh, an innovator in the, the concept of this practical, uh, practical playbook, the uh, sort of a toolkit for how do you integrate um, community and population health uh, efforts into uh, 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 primary care infrastructure. So we will look forward to the continued successes of that. Um, Kathy, uh, folks are fascinated by your experience at, at Vanguard. Do they, does the employer, do they, the company themselves, do they see what they've done as a competitive advantage for them? They absolutely do. They do. And, and again, I think the surveys that we do of the population that tells, you know, that, that the employees say they value that as one of their strongest benefits now, they absolutely know it makes them more yeah. competitive. Yeah. It's where the, our project sees a lot of alignment with employers. And, you know, inertia at rest takes some energy to overcome. People are used to doing things the way they've done them. Uh, Tom mentioned earlier uh, uh, Paul Grundy, who's been called the godfather of the patient-centered medical home. I'll give you a description. If you ever see him anywhere in the world, you'll know him right away. He's, he's wearing a suit jacket, not a sport coat, suit jacket, but with jeans and tennis shoes, and he's got a big button that says, End Medical Homelessness. Um, and his effort on behalf of IBM is because they're a, a global company, they've purchased health care in all the countries that Tom has written about in his books, and they understand that as a company, purchasing health care for employees in the United States, they pay more and get less. And so they're an advocate like... Um, well, like Van Carten stepping up to, uh, uh, to do that. Sort of contrary to that, the insightful innovation things that, uh, that Vanguard and the other companies working with your network have done, the opposite trend we've seen is sort of high deductibles, where people have really high deductible, no first dollar coverage for primary care. I'd just be interested in any of our panelists weighing on on what their observations have been on their, on their practice and on their patients. I can uh, take a stab at that to start with. Um, these, uh, it, it, the, the plans are all different, but um, what we see a lot, people have high deductibles, but they don't have any coverage for preventative services or chronic disease management. And so it defeats the purpose of what they were trying to do in the first place because um, people then can't afford to get their preventative care and their chronic disease management. And so I, th I think high deductible plans unless they're tied to paying for all the preventative care and the chronic disease management, or they stink. Um, so it, it's actually pushing people away from health care as, as opposed to bringing people into the fold. Yeah. So a key element that I think that we as physician groups have to get ready for is because of the high deductible plans is to be better um, uh, informed about the cost of care. I think medicine in general just breaks the first rule of economics, which is we don't know what the cost of anything is. And so, you know, and we, we've been able to, to kind of track the cost of an MRI without contrast at various levels in our uh, environment, and there might be a thousand dollar difference between the, the differences. And now when you're, as a consumer, have a three thousand or five thousand dollar deductible, it's it's a very simple process for you to decide if you're going to buy that TV or that TV based on the cost differential and then go from there. But you can't do that in our own health care. So what I've found in our practice is as, as consumers have gotten savvier, we need to be as equally savvy in understanding their stressors and to say that, you know what, under your Blue Cross Blue Shield program, it's 100% covered over, over here. If you go here, it's a $1,200 hit against your deductible and coinsurance. We need to know that. It's something that medicine has completely kept their, 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 their minds out of it, and it's time that we need to have more transparency. And I think the key element that it's great that Kathy's on this panel is the employers can make a huge difference. And the person that taught me that three and a half years ago was Don Bradley. And, that, and I've, I've learned that over the last three and a half years to be exactly the truth. You can structure benefits any way that you want. And so therefore, if you want to make it a zero copay for mental health, you can do that. You want to pay for telehealth, you can do that. So all these ASO groups can make significant changes in how their employees 
uh, can, can access health care far more than I think I can or Blue Cross Blue Shield could when Don was at, uh, at Blue Cross. Yeah. Other comments about the high deductible experience? I would uh, just add that we evaluated um, high deductible plans, can all, of the, all of the consumer driven products. We even had focus groups where we sat down with our population and we gave them examples of here's how the plan would work, here's the other option of a medical home. And we just found it was too complex for our demographic to really understand and also to feel confident that they would continue to seek preventive wellness care. They just wouldn't go pay for it because they didn't understand what it was gonna cost them or how the plan was exactly gonna work. So I think that um, we call it our velvet hammer. John Bray says that he got tired of sticks and carrots and he said um, that what you really have to have at some level is, is a velvet hammer because there is some segment of our population that are gonna wait until something catastrophic happens and they're not gonna assume any personal responsibility for their own prevention and wellness. And so that's why our plan kind of has these rules around it that you have to have a physical and you have to do certain things and as long as you're doing what is defined as industry standard prevention and wellness, then you will have a very attractive benefit and we'll make sure there's no bar barriers to you to, for you to get the care you want. So it's not just giving somebody an insurance card, it's an insurance card that comes with a hammer that says here are the things you have to do to keep this lower rate on the insurance plan. Yeah. And also, and it's true that doc doctors do not, we don't know how much things cost, but even when we're busy and, and, and volume is, is the way that we get paid, then it's a lot easier to order a test. So, so we also have to police ourselves and I'm very reassured by what I mentioned before, the Choosing Wisely campaign, where every 60 specialties now have decided they're monitoring themselves and what is absolutely not acceptable. You can't order a test in which there's no evidence and it costs thousands of dollars. So next next question specifically for you, Tom, uh, and, and we're looking for the magic which formula, you? sorry, <laughs> TR, uh, the magic formula that other countries use to expand their primary care. How did they, if they say face similar problems, how did they address increasing primary care? They all, as I said, all the health ministers <clears throat> I spoke to like to see a ratio of two to one to primary care doctors to specialists. Uh, this week I was in Canada, 55% of the doctors in Canada are primary care doctors, and it's too low. They're really worried about this, and we're at 32%. 30, yeah. So how do you do this? Well, um, there are two or three ways. One is, in medical school, you encourage students to go into this, and guess what? You graduate from medical school without a debt. Uh, nobody in any Western European country pays to go to medical school except in Britain under their new austerity regime, and the your tuition is based on your family income. The highest tuition for medical school is 3,000 pounds a year. That's $4,200 a year is the highest. So people don't graduate with a big debt, and therefore they don't have to go into higher paying fields. But most important, I think, uh, Britain has 62% uh, primary care doctors. And um, I don't know if anybody's seen our PBS film, Sick Around the World, and in that I spent some time with my family doc in London, and uh, he, uh, he uh, has, buys a new Jaguar every year, which he bills to the National Health Service. He owns his office and rents it to the National Health Service. He's a good capitalist, this guy. It's a socialist system, but he was a capitalist. And 62% uh, of the docs are primary care docs, and I said to him, why is that? You know, how, how come that happens in Britain? Well, he's a family doctor. He has a doctor's office on the main street, or they call it a surgery. He has a surgery on the high street. He makes twice as much as a cardiac surgeon in the National Health Service. That works. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so these countries understand the value of primary care. They value it. They steer new doctors toward it, and then they reward it. And if you do that, it works. Uh, so those maybe not familiar in, in primary care specialties, median in income is about half of uh, median subspecialty income. And especially, as you said, Tom, with folks graduating with huge medical debt, often um, it, that doesn't match up well. Yes. Um, uh, speaking of training folks and students and residents, the next question uh, is, uh, since we don't have any uh, students or residents on our panel, but we have people uh, directly involved in medical education, uh, what do you hear from the voices and opinions of uh, students and residents about the healthcare system, about primary care? 
So, so it's a crisis, as I've referred to already. But I think that the younger generation, um, if they are service-minded, we see we, there's, there's a lot of conversation or looking at millennials, generational things. And the millennials coming up are more about um, relationships and service. And so that's where I maintain some hope. But um, it, it is very difficult. And, and if they are if they are put in practices, put in practices. That's great language. But if 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 our opportunities for where they can practice are where there are not happy doctors, um, then that's that's not very re reinforcing either. So we are we are need to be in strong partnerships with all of our practicing doctors and make do all the things we're talking about to have happy doctors who want to work with our students and learners to show them how rewarding a career in primary care is. And so that's what we can control or try to control right now. Uh, but it's the, the numbers are really um, challenging. And a lot of the changes that are happening in our healthcare system now, I mean, 20 years ago, uh, nobody knew what primary care was or what we did. I mean, it's, it is better now, I think, um, as far as the, the country being aware of what primary care is. And we're trying this Family Medicine for America's Health program is doing it as well. So folks see what a great career it is. And, and actually, we talked about this beforehand. We need to put the right people in medical school, um, the people who are from rural communities or from communities that are underserved. And that's who we need to recruit into, into um, medical school and then hope that they, they um, learn and go back to a, a, a place that needs them. The, the family medicine groups, the academic family medicine groups around the country have developed the four pillars by which we are trying to increase our primary care workforce. And, um, and that's, that's one of them, is getting the right people into medical school. But as far as the viewpoint of students and residents, I think there are some in the audience. But they, students, <clears throat> again, I'm a little more hopeful. But residents, they are, they are absolutely overwhelmed with the debt. It's very, even when they're, re they're residents and they're trying to get jobs, they're, they're afraid. And, and they have to work a whole lot harder than they, uh, really hard to, to, to be able to pay back their debt. So it's, it's difficult. Well, as you said, we have some students and residents in our audience, and we actually have microphones in our audience, too. Perhaps we could hear from one of our students or residents. Whoever grabs the mic most quickly. Might be Aaron might have to grab the microphone. Aaron. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, I would just, I'd just like to echo a comment uh, that Conrad and I both mentioned that money makes a lot of sense, but Heart makes more, I think. And so, it, you know, you, to, to pay a surgeon $600,000 and a family doc 150, would we see them go back and forth? People have to want to be in the OR. And I, I want to be a family doc, and it's because of guys like you. So keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Sorry, we're going to end up running out of time, so this will be our last question. Okay, so so my quick, apologies. My name is Gary Franklin. I'm a third year resident at uh, Wake Forest uh, Family Medicine. And uh, uh, Aaron, I see you there over there. So good to see you. Um, yeah, so I mean, that's crushing. You know, I'm a quarter million dollars in debt. I have a wife and a family. And, you know, it's hard to kind of tell medical students when they come through the office, like, hey, this is something you should do. The love has to be there for it, number one, but uh, the financial incentive has to be there, too. And I think that's just what has to happen. I mean, it's just that simple. Well, thank you for all your questions. I'm going to make just a few closing remarks. But first, I'd like to thank uh, T.R. Reed and our panel for all of their time and thoughtful <laughs> comments. And again, I'd like to thank all of you for being here, for your questions, and for your kind attention. Uh, we are in the beginning efforts of, of this uh, campaign. Uh, as, uh, as, as Mary mentioned, the time is right. More people understand the value of primary care than they ever have before. The research that is informing our project shows that that is absolutely true and that there's a window of opportunity to make this transformative change in our healthcare system right now uh, as far as having this primary care foundation. We encourage your engagement uh, in that, and we're taking our uh, roadshow to other locations uh, and uh, other venues. And the idea is to create that 
to build on that awareness in, in the general public, but in policyholders, in, in employers, so they understand the Vanguard story and understand that they don't just have to work through an intermediary to ratchet down payment on all healthcare services, but that by actually paying primary care differently and better, that they actually might see a positive return, um, as they've seen. Uh, I'd, let's just comment on some of the, uh, the comments from our, our panel. Uh, Dr. Bajold's comment about reducing uh, admissions 80% in five years, and that wasn't even his goal. That was just the outcome of doing good care, and yet the payment system isn't really aligned with those efforts, and what I heard him say was he gave that care away, and, and there aren't too many people that are gonna be in a position to do that. So if we want that sort of return, we need to invest in it. Um, uh, Mary's comment about training in teams to be able to then practice in teams, but we also need payment that aligns with, with teams. There's some of the important team members that are not providers of billable service in a healthcare fee-for-service system. So if you want the medical home team to function efficiently, it really needs to be a global payment for primary care, global primary care services over time that, that uh, compensates the entire team and the infrastructure and technology they need to do their, their work. Uh, we talked about patient engagement, and I'm so glad we had a patient voice today. Uh, we have a patient member of my board of directors who I, I often say has been, no, I won't say it in public, but anyway, she throws a certain flag uh, when, uh, when we sort of get too far off the reservation and uh, into what we think is patient-centered. And the way to find out what patients want and need from healthcare is to ask them. Um, and we uh, really see a key part of our initiative to encourage all practices to have a patient advisory mechanism of some kind, a, a council, it might be an individual person. Because as physicians, we don't always know what it is they want. Sometimes it's the parking and the billing office that it's not the care we deliver them. Or it's, it's things that can be easily fixed uh, and it will enable their more positive healthcare experience and by doing so, improve their healthcare outcome. So we encourage all practices to have that sort of a mechanism. Community health centers are actually required by law to have that, but, but we see a value of that and, and potentially those organizations having some ability to interact with one another and contribute to transforming our, our healthcare system. Um, I, I like Tom's purple leg um, syndrome uh, story. You know, the reason that that encounter worked is because Tom knew his doctor and his doctor knew Tom. And, you know, if people get their health care and, uh, and no um, uh, negative comment at all about our colleagues that work in retail health clinics or in urgent cares or emergency departments because they do the best job that they can in the environment in which they work, but they don't have the opportunity to build that continuity trust relationship to get people uh, to know them over time. Because the reason that Tom accepted that and didn't think he needed an MRI is because he knew that doctor cared about him and said, that's just a purple leg, go home, go ski. Um, <laughs> if, if, you know, a, a, f a fearful patient with a new problem, uh, you you know, and they're in the, the ER and they say, gee, I'm really worried about something bad. They're going to get some diagnostic test that is actually more likely to hurt them than to help them. That's back to the choosing wisely aspect of things is we need to not do services that are more likely to, to hurt them uh, than to help people. Um, running out of my comments. Oh, I like Karen's comments about somebody in for a cold and getting a colonoscopy. That's a little far reach. <laughs> but, but what I always tell my patients when I see them is, okay, now we've talked about what you want to talk about. Let's talk about what I want to talk about and what I think is important for your health. And if they know that I care about them and that what I'm recommending is based on best medical evidence for their treatment, it, it, it doesn't seem quite such a far reach to recommend that colonoscopy or that follow-up cholesterol or that, you know, their blood pressure is elevated for the fifth time in a row when they came in for an episodic visit and they really can't afford to ignore it anymore. That's what comes from a continuous continuity, trust-based relationship um, over time. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm, um, I'm going to stop and I would just encourage you uh, to continue to follow this campaign. Our, our website is uh, healthisprimary.org. Uh, an edited version of today's uh, video of our panel will uh, be posted there within some reasonable amount of time. Um, but there's also lots of patient resources uh, and, and other stories that we didn't have time to tell in North Carolina and around the country about what's happening in primary care uh, to really make health primary. Uh, one of the questions that I didn't get a chance to ask our panel, but I'll just ask it on, or answer it on behalf of the project, is how do we build this prevention and wellness perspective into the newest generation, you know, into children, into adolescents, and, and in some 
in some cases, it's the youngest people in our country that get the worst health care. Once they're, once they're in kindergarten, have their basic immunizations, um, and until they start to have children or health problems, often sort of fall off the radar screen, and we need to reach out to them. But, but our campaign is, is, uh, is, uh, is designed to educate them about the importance of that. You see some of our ads around the room that are promoting the importance of primary care to them being well. Um, and soon we'll have more resources that are available for people's offices uh, to, to give out to patients that button instead of in medical homelessness, it can say make, his home, make health primary and start a dialogue between you and your patient about what that really means. So again, thank you all for being here and we hope you'll continue to be engaged in our project. Have a great day, thank you very much.